I'm Bob Short and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia and Young Harris College. We're here on the campus of the university with Ray Holland, longtime state representative, very successful lawyer, and an I like to refer to him as a reformer. Thank you. Ashburn, Georgia. Ashburn, Georgia, that's my hometown. Ashburn is a small town in southwest Georgia, along Interstate 75. It's, uh, it's home of the world's largest peanut, the Georgia State Peanut Monument. That's one of my small <laughs> bills in the legislature. And uh, it's in Turner County, and that's where I was raised and went to high school. <clears throat> and was, of course, part of my district throughout my service, along with several other counties. Uh, nice place to grow up in, uh, excellent education system, a lot of good people, a lot of good family and community support, and uh, I was very proud when I first ran for the legislature. I had, uh, I had five opponents to begin with. One, one opponent ran out. It was the year after longtime State Representative Earlene Sizemore, who recently passed away, had decided to retire and run for school superintendent. And uh, when I ran, four others announced. Uh, one fellow, as I said, uh, stepped out of the race after he saw how intensely it was going to be run. Uh, but I was always proud of the fact that we, run, we ran an excellent, perhaps the first modern state representative race in southwest Georgia. I'd worked for George Busby in his campaign as a, as a college student, and I used a lot of the same things that Governor Busby's campaign did. I used his colors, red and and black and white, and uh, we had brochures and billboards and television ads. And back then in 1988, most state representative campaigns handed out uh, combs and pins and fingernail files. And so we did an excellent job in talking back about uh, uh, Turner County. I was very proud to, uh, in, in some areas, get about 88% of the vote of my home county. And that's won that race without a runoff. That's exceptional. I never had opposition again in, uh, in the seven terms that I, that I served in the House. Then the University of Georgia. Well, the University of Georgia, I, I came here in 1971. I majored in political science. I had uh, uh, the wonderful opportunity to have some of the great professors here at the university <clears throat> in political science and in other fields. Uh, Albert Say in political science, uh, Robert Clute, Eugene Miller, uh, were some of, Leif Carter was some of my professors. <clears throat> Wonderful lifetime friendship with Miss Frances Wallace, who was a, a remarkable professor in the English department. Uh, and I graduated. I was I worked hard and graduated summa cum laude in, in the honors program and in, in majoring in political science, and then went to law school, and attended law school here at UGA. So I can now tell my daughter, who, Elizabeth, who, who was basically raised in my legislative service in the House of Representatives, played there. When, she, when I see her up here, I can tell her that both of her parents, my wife Marion and I, uh, were our double dogs. And uh, Marion went to the University of Georgia and University of Georgia Law School also. Uh, so you were always interested in politics. I, I had got the bug. I got the bug when I was a freshman in high school. There was and is an, an outstanding program for young people in Georgia sponsored by the state YMCA called Youth Assembly. It's a model youth legislature I know you're aware of that, that meets at the Capitol every year. The young people of Georgia take over the House chambers and the Senate chambers and the governor's office and, and actually have three or four days of, of, of going by the rules and passing laws and debating laws and thinking about policy I did that as a high school student, and I can tell you as a person that served 14 years in the House that, that it's such excellent training and so similar to actually really being in the House. But mm -hmm. when I went the first time as, a, uh, as a, 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 a sophomore in high school, actually, I think I may have said another year, I just decided I wanted to be in the legislature. And I, I guess if I look back on my life, perhaps uh, Majoring in political science and, and, and going to law school may have been a tool to let me be in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I served with that organization as their legislative advisor uh, when I was in the House. And uh, I'll probably mention Elizabeth too many times here, but she was very, very fortunate and, and successful in the program too and was elected youth governor a few years ago before she left high school. Wonderful. So you're elected in, in uh, 
1988. I was. Began your service in 1989. I did. And I'll bet the first thing you did was to go to what we call rookie school at the University of Georgia. It was the first big event uh, for our legislative training was where all the new legislators gathered here in Athens to, you know, I think it's called the Biennial Institute. Um, I was a, a young person who'd been involved, I'd been involved also, you ask, in Democratic Party politics. Mm -hmm. By that time, I had been a delegate to the National Convention of the Party about twice. I was on the state committee for the Democratic Party for eight years. So I was used to being in politics, and I used to being in Democratic politics, but it was different to be in the Democratic uh, and uh, part of the House of Representatives and in the House of Representatives, both with Democrats and Republicans, when you came to an event like the Biennial Institute, because you were very much a freshman and a new person, both in reality and in treatment by your fellow uh, colleagues. Uh, that institute provides basic training for people who come from all walks of life about how the legislative works, legislature works. Mm -hmm. I, uh, as a uh, political science student at Georgia, my legislative uh, uh, training was under Dr. Delmer Dunn, who was such a longtime uh, great professor here at the University of Georgia and administrator. He taught us very well, and so a lot of the things they were teaching at the Biennial Institute was on a, on a different level than you'd study it in a college course, of, uh, of course. But nevertheless, it was on a level to let people from all walks of life that had no background in politics before their election learn the basics of, about how the legislature mm -hmm. worked. But uh, you learned very fast that the Biennial Institute probably was, was then, and I suspect still is, an opportunity for the leadership to get to know their new members mm -hmm. and, to, and to meet them and bring them into the fold. and. Uh, you know, information is something that they were always willing to provide to you and graciously, but uh, sometimes you had to figure out the questions that you needed to ask. They'd answer the questions you asked, but sometimes you had to figure out the right questions. Uh, One of my sayings was that in the legislature, uh, knowledge was power, but the control of that knowledge was more power. <laughs> and the Biennial Institute started that uh, routine. That's where I, we, you meet your, your colleagues for the really first time. What was your first impression of your colleagues? Well, I guess in any, any um, organization you soon gravitate to people with, with familiar backgrounds and in history. Uh, I, at that uh, institute I met and immediately developed a, a great bond and friendship that has been solid for a lifetime with uh, three or four or five other legislators. Representative po Ken Poston from Ringgold, uh, Representative Curtis Jenkins from Forsyth, Representative Ron Fennell, then from Brunswick, and then Representative Doug Teeper from DeKalb County. We, we had similar backgrounds. Ron had worked for Governor Miller. Uh, Doug and I had been at the University of Georgia at the same time. Ken and my brother went to law school together. And Curtis had been involved in, in, the, in the congressional office. And so we all had similar backgrounds of young people who'd been involved in politics before we came to the legislature. I think that's what made it new and different about us, and that probably had a lot of direction about all of our legislative careers, is that in the past, I really think before that time, simply because of the time in our country and our state, uh, people had come to the legislature who'd been the local uh, pharmacist or the local um, city council person uh, who just stepped up and been a popular person in their community, and that's still a wonderful way to have a citizen legislature. But I think we were one of the first groups that had a background in, of, in politics in which we were already very experienced. And to some extent, that helped us move along in how the legislature works. And to some extent, I think it might have made us a little frustrated. The leadership, um, uh, it's like when you're walking onto campus and you see your professor for the first time. There's a certain degree of shock and awe. You know, that was Tom Murphy. I've, I've heard about him since I was in high school. Uh, interesting fellow, hard to get to know, but but. Uh, when, when did you first meet the speaker? I first met the speaker in in a Democratic Party meeting in Savannah, just before I announced for the legislature. Uh, Monty Vesey from Tifton knew me, and he walked me over and introduced me in in early '88 to Speaker Murphy, and uh, told him that I was going to be running for, for Representative Sizemore's seat. 
as you, un, as you can imagine, Speaker Murphy didn't know how that race was going to turn out, so he was very uh, circumspect about his words and said, good luck and we'll see how it turns out. Uh -huh. um, other, uh, and, and then uh, other leaders we met at that Biennial Institute that, that uh, became very important friends and, and, and role models to me, uh, Larry Walker from Perry, Terry Coleman from Eastman, you know all these names, and, mm -hmm. and, and in, in particular Representative Groover, Denmark Groover from Macon was so, so instrumental in my service and, and, and a friend and a colleague and, and uh, both before and after the speaker's race uh, played an important role in what we could do in the legislature. So you became friends with a group of young legislators that later became known as the Four Horsemen. I don't know who calls them that. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I always said it was the gang of four plus one because uh, you, you've got me and Ken and uh, Doug and Ron. Uh, all of us were single when we were elected to the legislature. And uh, Curtis Jenkins was a dear friend too, but he was already married and lived in Forsyth and he, he would go home every night. So uh, it took a, us a little while to realize that, that Curtis would would stay and, and, and meet with us late and talk with us and visit with us and go out to dinner with us. And so uh, I always called it the Gang of Four Plus One, and I don't know who in, invented that. I know, by the way, that some other legislators have used, a group of uh, young legislators have used that since then. So, uh, but, but these, these five individuals, well, including I think, me. I think the, the story is that Poston was from near Chattanooga, and the Chattanooga newspaper I see. Picked you guys up and called you the, the uh, four horsemen. Well, that, that, you know, news coverage. I don't know was, whether he was predicting that Poston <laughs> was going to make the world come to an end or not. I, I wondered about that, too. You know, uh, news, news reports got us into all interesting, uh, all sorts of interesting uh, uh, circumstances. Um, <clears throat> I'm jumping ahead and not trying to get to that topic, but uh, during a reapportionment fight in 1992, the leadership was determined to protect a, an, a really good guy, I won't name it, well, Ward Edwards, I just know he, Ward wouldn't mind, he's still living, and he loved the story too. He had reapportionment problems. He was from a small area northwest of Americas, and, uh, and the leadership was determined because he was the, the majority whip at that time, I think, or one of them, mm -hmm. to, to protect uh, Ward's seat. And there was only one place to go, and that was to Representative Skipper's area, who was the, the newest member of the legislature from that area. And uh, I understood that because I had been the newest member from further south in Georgia, and that's, that's a dangerous place to be in reapportionment when you're going to lose people from southwest Georgia. And um, our group, that group you talked about, and, and, and some other of the younger legislators, and uh, Representative Porter, who was... Uh, who was uh, Governor Miller's floor leader, said, you know what, that's not the way the district ought to be drawn, that Jimmy's district, uh, he's got enough people to have a district, and we all wished Ward well, but you shouldn't destroy Representative Skipper's district to take care of somebody else. And we had a floor fight on reapportionment, mm -hmm. and we won. We beat the leadership. And Bill Shipp put in his uh, newsletter he, he said that, that he named us by name and said this was the winds of change in the Georgia House of Representatives. I think that went to our head a little bit. And it was the next year that the speaker's race took place and I often wondered if, if Bill Shipp may not have gotten that wrong <laughs> and if we uh, might have been encouraged to, uh, to have that battle that did not succeed because others thought that, uh, that, that future battles would succeed also. Well, history tells us that uh, your group set out to change the Georgia General Assembly, the House. Did you have any specific goals in the beginning or did you just sort of feel your way through it? I think there were t uh, two as far as me individually. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I think probably true for all of our, uh, all of our colleagues that you've talked about, those younger, those younger members. Um, I think all of them except Curtis and I have run for Congress. Uh, so I, I think that we all had future political uh, ambitions. Uh, I certainly thought, thought I would run for the state Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know during reapportionment I always carefully took care of how the congressional district was drawn in southwest Georgia. Uh, 
but you understood in politics that you also needed to look at what doors were open. So I don't guess I had a long term mapped out, here's where I'll be 10 years from now, although some of my friends would say I did. Um, usually when you do that, then that's the story of what didn't ha turn out right. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, sure, I had uh, my own uh, uh, ambitions of, of, of doing other things in Georgia politics. I did not envision, frankly, being in the House of Representatives as long as I was. But uh, also, um, I really did run a campaign and came to the, came to the House with, a, with an idea that government could work for people and ought to. And that's mm -hmm. what people really were frustrated about. Mm -hmm. I think that continues today. I think I thought that people wanted somebody to come out there. We were a democratically, profoundly democratically controlled state. But I thought that regardless of party, people who voted for people in office were, were just desperate to have somebody come and explain to them what the issues were, how to balance, how we had to balance one thing against the other, good, good ideas versus budgetary considerations and come back and tell the truth and be influenced more by the, uh, by the people who sent us than the folks that were standing in the halls, who were good mm -hmm. people, but they were paid to represent a particular issue. The only people that represented the folks that were back home were the folks that were elected. And so I, I did come up <clears throat> with the idea that, um, that the legislature was not ba about going to dinner and not about receptions and not about... Uh, uh, a, 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 a just a marvelously uh, fantastic opportunity in your life to to participate in this this organization, but also do some good for people. I would I would look over um, every year uh, the uh, National Legislative Institute's um, description of other new ideas that other states had had in addressing problems they saw, and sometimes I'd lift a bill out of those. <coughs> um, uh, those documents that other states had tried to, if I, if I knew about a problem that needed to be addressed in Georgia. Uh, so I tried to be a good student of, of other legislators. I, I tried to look around and see what uh, were the problems uh, facing our state. And uh, on a few occasions, when I went up there, I suppose that the number one issue addressing our part of the state was and, and continues to be is the lack of economic development in rural Georgia. Uh, I thought if I was going to, literally, my father said, uh, would always tell me when I would get tired about something, he'd say, remember, you, you didn't just ask these folks to send you up there, you, you begged them to send you. <clears throat> and so I wanted to come away from my first year with uh, something that we had done to make life in rural Georgia better and try mm -hmm. to think about how to do that. I'd like um, to digress for a moment and ask you, if you feel that there really is two Georgias, as has been debated and is continuing to be debated uh, even today. Um, the answer I gave back then and the answer I still give is there's, there's not only two Georgias, there, there's three and four Georgias. Uh, you've got um, the metropolitan issues uh, of, of urban Georgia, Atlanta, and the, and the, the st statistical metropolitan area around Atlanta. Uh, the issues facing the most impoverished counties of our state uh, that, are, that are just totally different. Um, and, in fact, and I think impact upon the urban areas. One of the premises for one of the early bills I did that tried to address uh, rural economic development uh, was that if you don't provide opportunities in uh, our rural areas, the people are going to leave. Children are not going to come back. And if people who are leaving the rural areas because they have no jobs there are going to the urban areas, you're adding to the infrastructure needs there too and the cost of operating urban government. And then you also have the, the middle range cities, the si cities of the size of Albany and, uh, and Columbus and, and, uh, and, and then you have the uh, both uh, the, the parts of South Georgia that have some type of large employers and some that literally have none. So yes, I think there is, uh, is, is, is unaddressed needs in different parts of our state and uh, that continues to this day to the detriment of our entire state. 
Um, one of the things I did try to do, and I think successfully, I, I attribute my friend Doug Teeper to this, is I was a rural legislator. I think, I think my record was progressive, um, but nevertheless, I was, I was a, my, my grandfathers both were farmers. My dad was a farmer. We still uh, own our family farms. My brother John and I were the first uh, uh, people that were not farmers in our family. We were both, both lawyers in our firm. And I think my friendship with Doug, uh, he, he was absolutely the opposite. He was from urban Georgia, from DeKalb County, and he stayed involved in urban issues. And, and knowing him helped me realize, and I, I think, I think to, you know, we had mentioned Tom Murphy earlier. I think he was good about this too. To be a more rural legislator that realized that you don't, it might be good politics back home to bash uh, the Atlanta and the Atlanta papers, but it's not good for Georgia. And I think that one of the things that Doug did well for me was to introduce me to urban issues, and I tried to be a good legislator for urban issues too, and he would help me on my rural issues. Right. The, one, the one more thing about our group, that, that, and I'll leave that to your questions, it was interesting that we were from various backgrounds and parts of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Ken from Northwest Georgia, Doug from urban DeKalb County, uh, Ron from the coast, so interested in his bridges, and, and, uh, and Curtis from Middle Georgia and me from South Georgia. Uh, so we, we, we really brought a lot of different opinions from a, from a group of friends in different areas of our state represented in that group. Getting back to being a freshman, uh, normally the speaker gave the freshman legislators an opportunity to choose committees. Were you, <coughs> were you given that opportunity? Well, yes, and, and it was not just the it was not just the um, the freshman legislators. Everybody. Uh, you know, and I tell these stories, of course, in the perspective of that's how it was done when Speaker Murphy was there because he was, uh, his last year as Speaker was my last year as State Representative. I did not get to serve under uh, Speaker Terry Coleman, and I'm sorry about that. I, mm -hmm. I left on my own choice, but I wish I'd had some time under Terry also. Um, but uh, everybody got a chance to ask for their, uh, their committee assignments, and so I would... Uh, asked for my, the, the committee assignments I wanted. I'd made a campaign promise, being from South Georgia, that I would ask for the Agriculture Committee. Mm -hmm. And so I made that my number one choice. But I also made appropriations and rules as my second and third choice, which I had no chance of getting. And uh, I ended up uh, getting Agriculture, which was my number one choice. And I mm -hmm. think that was a, a gesture of support for the, from the Speaker's office and had really good others committee assignments that, that first few years. I remember my second term in asking for a committee assignment, uh, somewhere down the list I had put the reapportionment committee and uh, I didn't get appropriations or rules again in my second year, which again is going to take much longer. And I got reapportionment. I remember going to Steve Anthony and almost, who was the speaker's aide, mm -hmm. and almost complaining a little bit. I said, you know, I didn't get any change of committee assignments except reapportionment, and that was far down the list. And Steve so very well uh, told me, he said, you, you think about this, it said this is the reapportionment year, and that's another gesture of support for you to be on that committee, that's where you need to be. And it was where I needed to be that year. But I thought I was given good ass committee assignments by the speaker, and, uh, and uh, they served my district very well at that time. I had uh, state planning and community affairs that handled growth strategies that first time, and had uh, governmental affairs uh, that, uh, that handled our state employees, which became an important part of the people that I was identified with in the legislature. So you got along well with Speaker Murphy? I think, it, I think that he and I uh, got along fine our first, my, my first term. I think there was, a, as with the Biennial Institute, I think there was a real, I've never asked anybody this, but it was very apparent, there was, especially among the freshman Democrats, the Democratic leadership made a very strong effort to develop relationships and friendships. And so we were, uh, and when I say we, I mean the entire Democratic freshman class was often invited to, uh, to events and small events that maybe more senior uh, members of the House and chairman were not invited to. I asked uh, 
I remember in retrospect with some making fun of myself when I tell this, I remember asking uh, Larry Walker one time, who was the majority leader, why wasn't another chairman asked to this event? Looks like he ought to be here too. Is there something wrong there? And he said, oh no, he's going to do fine. Well, after those first few years, the freshmen no longer got invited to those events. That was a recruiting tool. And what we really noticed about that was there was an interim election our first year. And so much attention had grown to the group of young people who were my friends. Uh, I know Ken and I, and, and, and even, even sometimes our whole group wasn't invited to some, some pretty big events that was, I think, to show us how, how the leadership functioned and what circles they walked in and friends that they introduced us to. But uh, the, second, the second year, there was a, a single person elected, Representative Van Street out of, uh, out of Coffee County. And all of a sudden, all that attention went to that one person. And I think that, that gave us a little perspective about that recruiting tool. Mm -hmm. But Speaker Murphy and I got along fine, but I wouldn't want to overplay that. It was just, I was a new member. Uh, he was a hard person to get to know because you, he didn't have a lot of time. Uh, but he was very gracious. You know, I had my issues with Speaker Murphy over the years, but you would always have to say, he was, his door was always open to all members. Uh, he was... Um, uh, when you were there, he would stay there and meet with you until the day was over. Uh, I mean, the, everybody was gone. Uh, he was a progressive legislator, and he watched out for urban Georgia and rural Georgia, too. Now, again, we differed about some of the ways that it took so, it just took such struggle to have change in the House. But, mm -hmm. but at that time, I think we had a good relationship, and I think, uh, uh, I think uh, most of the freshman Democrats did. Let's talk a minute about your, some of your reforms. Uh, I remember you had uh, your group had uh, a budget reform caucus, and uh, you worked on uh, several uh, projects. Uh, tell us how you developed your program to take to the legislature, when most of those legislators, I think you will agree, weren't too interested in reform. I came away during my, the early part of my service and, and at the end of my service, so I, I'm comfortable with the, this observation is correct, that uh, the vast majority of the people who go and serve in the state legislature that I knew were good, uh, honest, and, uh, and well-directed people who wanted to try to do the right thing. Uh, some more than others uh, uh, tended to follow the leadership's lead instead of being maybe uh, the person that, in, that, that instituted the ideas. And some, uh, and some, I think, there are those that maybe simply enjoyed being in the legislature and the friendship and association. But I think they were all good people. But um, in any institution like that, that has been around so long, and, and I think that in fairness, uh, it, it's probably fair to say about our group of new young legislators, that maybe we didn't uh, pay enough attention to the fact that, 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 that some of the procedures and some of the policies and some of the ways the legislature worked, even though they seemed to be silly or, or at least not efficient, uh, were, were very much ingrained in the lives of folks that had been there 20 and 30 years. And it probably was an error both personally and as far as how you make things to change to not recognize that uh, People who think that things are going okay and think that they're doing a really good job, and for the most part were, probably don't like to hear somebody come along and say, but here's how you could do it better. Um, I didn't, the, the Reform Caucus that you're talking about was a, was a group of legislators that, that worked on some policies after the Speaker's election. Um, I did not actually become a part of the the Reform Caucus after the Speaker's race because I, probably again just by example of Denmark Groover, after the Speaker's race in which our group and, and, and 20 or 30 others uh, didn't support Speaker Murphy and supported DuBose Porter for election as Speaker in, in the 1992 caucus. Um, I remember after the election was over, there were several things about the general election that may have affected some of that outcome. But by the time the election was over and, and Murphy was the nominee again and DuBose, by that time, had been, had been defeated. Um, 
Then Mark Groover had, came over to me and said, go talk to DuBose and tell him to go shake the speaker's hand and concede and let this be over with. And then Mark Groover had been there so long and was such a wise man and such a great leader in Georgia that could have served many other years. I did it, and DuBose did that too. And I think, I think Denny realized that, um, um, that two or three things. Number one, the old system would have been whoever opposed Tom Murphy was, uh, or whoever opposed the speaker, if it was the previous Speaker Smith, uh, was ostracized for a long time and was just cut off from being able to do anything. I think that was the old system. I think more than anybody else that Denmark Groover realized that you couldn't take talented people who had had ideas. Maybe, maybe they, you didn't agree with what they did and maybe you didn't like what they did, but you couldn't have a successful legislative team going forward unless you, if you, if you ostracized them, they're your enemies forever. And if you brought them into the team and tried to work with them, you had a better chance going forward. With the number of Democrats going down, with the good people that was supporting DuBose, I think Denny played a role in, uh, in keeping the, the aftermath of the speaker's race from being a big negative. So when the speaker's race was over, one other thing that Denmark Groover did, who was the minority whip, he kept Ken Poston and I on as, uh, as assistant whips for the Democratic Party. I, I think he probably got fussed out about that, at least in the first year, but he did it anyway. And it, it said uh, to us that um, somebody's listening out here and you've still got a role to play. And it also was good politics back home. So when the, when the speaker's race was over for me, it was over for me. And even though I continued to back reforms and voted with the Reform Caucus so often, I didn't meet with them because I thought that somehow perpetuated that antagonism between DuBose and that group and Ken uh, and, and the Speaker. And as you know, Ken and the Speaker had, Ken Post and the Speaker had many other battles going forward. But I went to Speaker Murphy after the election and I, I talked with him about some of the issues that, um, that um, had bothered me about, about the election how it was handled. Uh, I, I think we've talked about earlier that I had written up, a, as a good University of Georgia political science major, I wrote up about an eight-page memo. It's what really bothered me and what I wish would be addressed that I sent out to the leadership before I decided to support DuBose. And we didn't get any, it, it was not that, the response to that was almost that you couldn't raise any ideas at the time. So uh, I went to the speaker and I talked with him about that and I told him that, uh, I, I wish that we had had opportunities to talk about those ideas before the speaker's election and that uh, I was, I, I told him I was sorry that I had not come and talked with him about him without those, about those ideas and about the things in that memo before we had to decide uh, uh, ab about what we do in the speaker's race. I also, I very seldom have apologized in politics, but I apologize for one interview I did. Speaker Murphy had said that the, that the contest was hurting Democrats. Uh, and uh, I, I, I made some comment back in an interview that made it to the Atlanta uh, Journal-Constitution that uh, the speaker saying that this contest hurt Democrats uh, was like a uh, candy salesman saying that Dennis caused candy, <laughs> um, caused cavities. And I, he, he said he didn't even remember it, but I thought that that was uh, unprofessional. I don't like negative politics. I introduced legislation later on to try to have fair campaigns in Georgia, and that was contrary to how I served and how I worked. And, and interestingly enough, he, he, he looked at me and he said, we'll just never talk about this again. And we never did. We never talked about the speaker's race again, and I was not a part of the, the Reform Caucus. However, I did support the issues they were supporting. In particular, one of the big issues in the speaker's race was, you know, you, you go up to do good for your district. Uh, there is a vast difference of opinion about what role state government should play in funding projects in local governments. Uh, we can, my, my great, I hope we'll talk about this later today, but my, the thing I loved most about the service in the legislature, other than the legislature itself and making laws and my great friends, was my role in later, later years about being on the Appropriations Committee subcommittee for the university system 
And, and that literally was my dearest love in my service. And probably the thing I miss most today is that wonderful association that I developed with the university system. But um, uh, at the time um, of, of that particular um, uh, contest, uh, we were still, as young freshman legislators, worried about, as we should, what to do right for Georgia, but, but our first role was what to do for our districts. And I came from an impoverished, it's still impoverished area of Georgia. Uh, Georgia had developed a tiered uh, categorizing of counties in, uh, in uh, Department of Community Affairs, and, and uh, two of my counties was in the bottom 25% uh, uh, of the counties in Georgia. Interestingly enough for a political science student, my other county was the fastest growing county in southwest Georgia, Lee County. My other two counties, the, the poorer counties, were Worth and Turner. I later represented also Tiff County. Um, but we were interested in doing things for our, our local communities. In the university years, I could help uh, through the appropriations process approve funding for this great University of Georgia. And when I, I remember the first time the Zell Miller uh, uh, Learning Center was uh, talked about over there. But, it, but there's no mechanism to provide that kind of support to a small county of less than 10,000. And so when you do something locally, uh, somebody's going to call it pork barrel politics. But whether it is or not, and whether it's right or not, I, I, I felt like if you, back to my economic development, if you didn't provide theories, if you did not provide some basics uh, that people were looking for, to have for families that worked for companies. Nobody was going to come to these rural communities. So I always tried to concentrate on recreation and things for and, and opportunities for children, small parks and pl small playgrounds in my districts. And, and when, when we found out after our first session, at least I didn't have any of the requests that I made in, in, the, in the budget placed into the budget. Not the first one. After all that uh, support of the leadership, I remember asking, uh, and, and Larry Walker tells this uh, and laughs about it to this day. He said, Ray Holland uh, asked me how, I got, how I'd ever get anything in the budget. He says, and I told him get elected five or six more times. <laughs> about, about five more terms later, I went to Larry and said, you know, Larry, just so you'll know, <laughs> I've been elected five or six more times. But um, then we began to notice that projects were being approved after the legislative session was over. Now the governor has, at least during uh, Governor uh, Harris and Governor Miller's administration and Governor Barnes' administration, had what we call the emergency fund. Uh, governor Miller, who was a friend of mine since I was in high school, was and and uh, it was always interesting for me to be a Zell Miller supporter in a House of Representatives during a governor's election year, in which the uh, the, one of the main opponents for the nomination in the Democratic Party was one of the House leaders, uh, Bubba mm -hmm. McDonald. Um, but Governor Miller was very good to me all during my service, remains a great friend. He's a, he is and, and um, always will be one of the most uh, visionary Georgians we've ever had. I, I had uh, just the great honor and just it was a touching moment to talk with him about two months ago as to how he was doing. and. Uh, and uh, he, he agreed in that conversation to do an interview with my daughter about the Hope Scholarship <coughs> program in which she wrote a paper for Dr. Bullock here at the University of Georgia about that. And Governor Miller was always good to me after the speaker's race to make sure I had projects in my district. Um, but what we were hearing was that, that projects were being approved out of, after the legislative session was over. And one of the chairman of the of, of, of one of the committees, uh, Chairman Caldron Caldwell one time after the speaker's race and after we made such a big stink about this slush fund, uh, Chairman Caldwell said, well, Ray, you know, you know, I helped you get a project for your home county for your sheriff's office down there because we, you needed a temporary sheriff's office and that's where we got that money. I didn't know it. I, I was appreciative of the help and actually felt a little funny about that then. But, a, but what we learned was apparently the, the legislature at that time was funding a, a, a fund that certain of the leadership could, almost like a governor's emergency fund. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps there was nothing wrong with that if it was 
uh, something that everybody knew about. But again, we go back to institutional uh, practices, and I don't know how long it had gone on. And, I, and it, like Chairman Colwell said to me, it didn't occur to him that there was anything to be criticized about that because he was helping people and helping the members. But I think the fact that we were, maybe it was a little sour grapes, but the fact that we didn't get funding, but we saw others after the legislative session get funding, we realized the money was coming from somewhere. <clears throat> And it turned out that there was this special fund appropriated and a certain number of the leaders after the um, session was over could go and approve some transfers of funds. And, and, uh, and even if it was well meant and even if it was a tool to do good in Georgia, that was one of those practices that was not the way good government operates or ought to operate. And so uh, during the speaker's race, that probably was the number one issue that, that caused a lot of us to look around and see uh, what could we do different. And, and Dubose Porter has, had done such an excellent and articulate job as, as Governor Miller's floor leader and, um, and, and really carried the message and held his own with Speaker Murphy when there was some conflict between what Governor Miller wanted and what Speaker Murphy wanted. Um, and the leadership he showed, the leadership he helped us with in that reapportionment issue I talked about, the fact that the, fu the, the funding mechanism bothered him too was a, uh, a big, a big uh, impetus in, in that speaker's race, at least what bothered me. That was and, known as the Green Door Committee. That's right. And um, Why was it called the Green Door Committee? I suppose that you had no, well, for one thing, a funding, some funding that had been approved by the, uh, I think the fair thing to say is I don't know. Okay. But what I think is, is that once a, a funding uh, appropriations had been proposed by the governor, approved by a subcommittee, placed into the, um, uh, the appropriations bill, and introduced and worked its way through the, the, through the system, you still had to go through that green door, that get a green light to actually get in the final bill that made it to the floor. But I don't know. I don't, you know, it could have been some other, uh, uh, other mechanism. Hmm. Let's talk about the budget for a minute. Well, but, but let, let, me, let, me, let me finish up just one second about that, though. And um, the, the Reform Caucus did, after the Speaker's race, in a, in a tough floor fight, and I, and I supported the, again, I, I, I thought it was time for the speaker's race to be over, but it wasn't time to set that issue aside. And we introduced legislation that said that appropriations such as that had to be line itemed in the budget, and it passed. And that, I think that probably was the great victory for that, uh, for that whole battle. Uh, was, was, it wasn't saying that the same people didn't get to make the decisions and say yes or no. It just said that, that everybody got to know what, where our state's money was going. And, uh, and if yours was approved, it was there. And if yours was not approved, it was not there. There was no after the fact. There is a mechanism in Georgia called the Physical Affairs Committee that is a statutory committee. And I was governor, the, the governor and the lieutenant governor and the speaker all appoint different members to the Physical Affairs Committee that does have statutory authority between the session to make some adjustments in the budget when, when emergencies or situations arise. But that was already in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in Georgia laws. It was a legal mechanism. And, uh, and so I, I was honored to serve for Governor Miller on the Physical Affairs Committee later on. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Miller is just a special person, uh, my friend forever. But he knew I was a House member. And he would always keep that in mind. We were close, but he was a house, I was a House member. And I remember when he was running for governor, he took his friend Ray Holland aside and said, Ray, don't you hurt yourself in the House because of me. Well, you, I was still going to fall on the sword for Zell Miller. Okay. On the other hand, when he was governor and he put me on the Physical Affairs Committee, he told me very clearly, he said, now, you're a House member, but when you're on that committee, you're my vote. <laughs> so <laughs> that sounds like Zell, doesn't it? You know, maybe we should say that... Uh, that Lieutenant Governor Miller and Murphy, Speaker Murphy, often had differences that reflected uh, political uh, views. Uh, 
And in that race that you were talking about, uh, Speaker Murphy had his own candidate uh, who was running uh, opposing um, Lieutenant Governor Miller along with others. Uh, I think people should know that, uh, that they were not on the same side at that time. Well, they, 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 it was legendary in Georgia politics before I came to the House that they had uh, bitter, bitter political and I think personal uh, uh, battles. Uh, I, I don't think it was just political. And, uh, and I was, I'd been around the Democratic Party so long that um, uh, 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 some of uh, Governor Miller's uh, staff members would, uh, would introduce me and say that I'd been raised in the Zell Miller School of Politics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I came a, an ally of Zell Miller, who was lieutenant governor at that time knowing that battle was coming and it was an awkward position to be in but I uh, I, I, I was friends with with Ch Chairman McDonald Bubba McDonald he's been a great Georgian a great public servant uh, he and I got along fine and um, it, there was no overt um, there was nobody ever handed you know got you aside and said listen you're a House member and we need you to be for Bubba McDonald. On the other hand, um, there were at least two events that some of the Speaker's staff did say, now listen, Ray, do what you want to do on the, and they were watching that for me. I don't think it had to do with Speaker. They said, do what you want to do in the governor's race, but you, you ought to go to this meeting in which this political consultant that Bubba's going to use is going to come talk to the members of the House, or at least to members of the Democratic Caucus. And uh, I remember, uh, uh, se several events like that that I that I did go to because I thought it was not going to hurt Governor Miller and and it didn't hurt me in the House either. But uh, no, that was a that was an interesting time to see the leadership square squarely behind Bubba McDonald and, and a lot of us uh, squarely behind Governor Miller. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let me let me add there too though. Back to you know I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I had this it just almost brought tears to my eyes to talk to Governor Miller a few weeks ago, but maybe two months ago. I hadn't talked to him in about 10 years, and he was just the same guy. And it was so wonderful to visit with him and to talk with Ms. Miller a little bit too and to share stories about our families. He literally <clears throat> had been the party director, executive director, when I was in, in, a sophomore here at the University of Georgia, first wanting to go to a Democratic convention. And so I had been with him uh, he'll tell the story uh, sometimes that uh, when uh, the lieutenant governor's race came open, uh, George Budsby was going to run for governor that year, but the governor's race it really hadn't lined up. Uh, the lieutenant governor's position, uh, it was going to be an open race for the lieutenant governor. And a, a bunch of my college friends and I invited <clears throat> uh, our executive director of the Democratic Party, Zell Miller, to underground Atlanta to have lunch at the Bucket restaurant I think it was called. Bucket Shop. Bucket Shop. <clears throat> and we begged him to run for lieutenant governor because we knew him and we wanted a candidate that we knew that we could work for. And he had just been appointed to the uh, Pardon and Pro Board. And he, um, he, he sounded like he was not going to run. And, with, and then within a few months he, uh, he decided he would run. And, uh, and that's, that's just sort of the history of Georgia for two decades. But for all the battles between Speaker Murphy and Governor Miller, <clears throat> I think it ought to be noted. Uh, Speaker Murphy was a fellow that, that, that believed in the rules of the House of Representatives. And he had this internal con uh, set of principles about how he governed as Speaker. He went by the rules of the House. He believed in, in the seniority system. He believed in the committee system. But on the other hand, <clears throat> he also saw that the people of Georgia elected Zell Miller as governor of our state because of, primarily because of the Hope Scholarship. It was the big idea of that time. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and I mentioned earlier that my daughter had interviewed with Governor Miller about, that, uh, about the Hope Scholarship and wrote a paper about what really happened and what was the background of how it passed. And when I read that and thinking back myself, it was very clear that had Speaker Murphy decided to stop the Hope Scholarship, he could have done that. And he had reservations long standing. That was another 
some time difference between Murphy and I because he had long-term reservations about the lottery and I thought it was something that we had to do and that the people wanted. Uh, but he could have easily stopped that. And, uh, and he, Steve Anthony observed that he, 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 he took the position that the people of Georgia had elected Zell Miller as their governor about that issue and they deserved a, a right to say on the lottery if they wanted it. Uh, that and perhaps uh, an excellent job by the floor leaders and, and Denmark Gruber coming down and making a great speech and made a did. difference, I think. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, Governor Senator Miller still gives uh, Denny Gruber credit for that bill passing. In the interview that my daughter did, uh, DuBose was very proud of the role, and he should be, that he played in, in really selling the Hope Scholarship. But uh, Governor Miller said it was down to the last few votes, and Denny had been, uh, call him Denny Groover, had been uh, not that supportive. And, and, and my daughter reported in the paper that, uh, she made an A-plus on it, by the way, uh, that, uh, that the governor invited uh, uh, Denmark Groover down to the governor's office, and they talked Marine to Marine, and, that, uh, and Denny went back and made the speech, and DuBose said in the paper, I thought it was cute, he said, we, we earned those last few votes. And, and Governor Miller respectively said, well, they did a great job, but I'm not so sure that that last speech by Denmark Groover didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I, I tell that story is this, because in spite of their great battles over the years, in spite of the constant pressure on some of us who were pro-Miller uh, in a house governed by Tom Murphy, that, that his... And again, we had, our, we, had, we had our differences in the race. We had our differences about reapportionment later on and, and some good issues too. But in spite of those great battles, uh, Murphy deferred to the process to let the Hope Scholarship pass and let the past, the past battles between he and Governor Miller step, step aside and let the people decide on that, decide on that issue and the issue of the Hope Scholarship. And that may have very well been the best thing that's happened in Georgia uh, in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it couldn't have happened without Zell Miller. But then again, it couldn't have happened without Tom Murphy. That's right. That's very true. Uh, let's talk a moment about one of the reforms that your group uh, began when you were, I guess, in your second or third term. Uh, that's the Ethics Commission. Well, um, going back to my, um, to my comments earlier on that, that I believed and believe still that, that the vast majority, when I say vast majority, it approaches 100% of people in, on both, in both parties, people with whom I agree with strongly and have friendships with, and people that I think have perhaps in later years made bad policy decisions from Georgia, for Georgia. Uh, I think people who are motivated by uh, good policy making and people who are motivated by how it looks in the polls. I think even looking across all the, that uh, range of people, you, uh, you see really good people serving. But, um, but nevertheless, uh, you, you become concerned about the, um, the influence of money and the influence of lobbying. And I, I tried my best to be a consumer and a pro-people legislator. And what I would find so often is, is when you introduce the most basic um, pro-consumer legislation that you were just... Uh, confounded by an army of people that uh, opposed doing something simple pro-consumer. Um, thus the saying in the legislature that no good deed goes on pun unpunished. I had a, I had a uh, simple bill of one, one year that said if you were going to give up your rights to have a Georgia court determine your a contract dispute in a contract and also if you were going to agree to mandatory arbitration that that paragraph had to be in bold and had to be initialed by all both parties or it wouldn't be valid. That's all it said. In my entire service, I had never had as many lobbyists hired to fight that one simple one-paragraph bill uh, simply because of the, uh, the people protecting their own turf. Uh, and so, 
And you can't, you can't fault our, our, our friends in the lobbying industry. There are some people that I think um, are, are not fair in their dealings with the legislature that tend to be punitive out in the halls. But the good lobbyists, as you well know, uh, were the people who would say, listen, I represent this, this, in, in, this entity. And here is how it affects my group. And here is why I think you should vote this way. On the other hand, here's the way it affects your constituents. And here's what the opposition will say. I hope you'll help me because I think we're right. But if you don't, I understand and we'll be talking on some other issue. That was the good mm -hmm. lobbyist. Mm -hmm. And the, there were others where if you've ever crossed them, that they'd hardly ever speak to you again for the next few years. Mm -hmm. Even those people you sort of understood were, were protecting the way they earned a living. Right. But, um, but vast amounts of money w w was spent in... Uh, uh, in legislative races, in contributions, um, in um, receptions, and in dinners. And I think that the, the thing that, uh, that, that probably was the, uh, the most positive outcome of, of any of the, and perhaps is really all we, you, you might need to say about the, the ethics reform legislation, was to try to put it all out there in, in, in the public's, uh, available to the public, so that if... Uh, if this amount of money was being spent to, on this issue, that the public could see it if they were interested in seeing it. And that if this amount of money was being spent to wine and dine a legislator, uh, that, that the public could see it. And I think that, that, that uh, having things out in the open and disclose it was, uh, disclosing the contributions and expenditures was uh, perhaps the, uh, the best outcome of the ethics reform. Um, I still think there are some institutional issues um, that have to do with uh, uh, funding of, of, of campaigns uh, that perhaps the, are going to take national Supreme Court decisions to deal with. Um, raising money for politicians is a never-ending uh, effort uh, that uh, I think your good public officials know they have to do it to run races in a media-driven uh, 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 age. Uh, and I hope they are not affected uh, in their decisions by the, the, the folks that are contributing. I think, the, uh, but, but you know that you, you make friends when, when, you're, when you're in public service, and I think the friends you make tend to influence you. But I've been very encouraged by, the, by campaigns in recent days, and some of which are generated by the tools that the, that the Internet provides to raise funds for campaigns in the smaller contribution levels. Mm -hmm. The concerns I still have that I don't think have been addressed even to this day, uh, again, with the premise that the people are good people and that some of the mechanisms that are being used, the taking the legislators to dinners and having the receptions are these time-tested institutions that have been going on for years. Nevertheless, if a judge in Georgia uh, were taken out to dinner the night before a, a case was handled before court by somebody that had an interest in the outcome and nothing was talked about but the meal was paid for and uh, it was a or a vacation out, or, a, or a, a speaking engagement out of state was paid for and uh, the case was handled the next day the judge would be thrown off the bench on the other hand that is for good or for bad a part of the standard operating procedures of of how and I'm not talking about the legislature I'm talking about Washington and other state legislators I came away with the feeling, and in, it, in, in some of the some of our some of the best people in public service service really opposed the ethics legislation that was done during my service uh, because they took it as an insult uh, that uh, to their integrity that that somebody taking them to dinner could could influence the outcome of an honest person's uh, attempt to do the right thing in the legislature, and again I I think in in large part. Uh, that, that people, uh, in, the mo in the largest part, people voted their conscience. But nevertheless, it's not a good thing. It, it's not good for the institution for uh, hundreds of dollars to be spent to, to wine and dine public officials before decisions have to be made. And I, and, and I guess I may have radicalized a little by saying I'm not sure why uh, elected officials should be entitled to be able to receive gifts from interested parties at all. But the, the le that, that was discussed in the ethics legislation, but that was the hardest thing to, to write into law because the one thing you don't want to do is to have 
uh, good public servants that made some kind of inadvertent mistake to, to find themselves in violation of ethics laws. A lot of discussion was, well, what would happen if your best friend was a lobbyist and they were in your wedding and they gave you a wedding gift? So it's hard sometimes to write ethics into law, but I think the efforts made during the 90s uh, was a great step, and I think the result of, of, of airing it out to the public, for the public to know what's being spent on the legislators individually as far as gifts, uh, what's being uh, spent uh, to influence uh, public uh, policy and contributions made to candidates it was a great step in Georgia's uh, history. Uh, I still think there's a lot to do, but I think it may take some federal laws and Supreme Court decisions that, uh, that recognize that uh, the individual people that elect government officials uh, don't have the uh, the monetized voice that special interests do in elections. Mm -hmm. and, and that's still a problem today. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a minute about budgets. You were on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, beginning at the very onset of a budget period, the, uh, the legislature has presented uh, a forecast, revenue forecast from the governor. What happens after that? Well, I actually think the appropriations process uh, was, wh was where the legislature perhaps worked the best during my service. I'm not saying because I was on the committee. It worked the best before I was there, except for the, the fact that you went through the process and still had the, a limited number of people making some of the final calls. Um, but uh, once the governor makes... Uh, uh, Rather than, than talking about the, the, the problems that were existing when we first came in, along during my service, uh, what would happen is, is the governor would present the budget to the legislature, and we would have a very detailed and itemized explanation of what the proposed expenditures for the state would be. That bill had to be introduced in the House of Representatives. Uh, the, the House had a, uh, an excellent system of showing you uh, on a tracking sheet, it was a, a, a wide sheet actually, you've seen them Bob, it's, uh, that tracks the department, uh, the expenditures, uh, and, and then you'd begin to see as the, uh, as the department, t entire expenses broken down by various categories, you begin to see as the, as the bill, it has to be a bill. Now the bill in the tracking sheet was different. It was a lot harder to read the bill simply because putting appropriations language into legislation was tough. But the tracking sheet would translate that bill into almost an accounting ledger that showed you the department requests and, uh, and, and finally at some point the committee recommend, the subcommittee recommendation, the committee recommendation, um, the House of Representatives uh, would then take the, the bill after it had gone through subcommittees and each subcommittee had reported to the to the full committee and the leadership in conjunction with the chairman would then uh, uh, propose a, a committee substitute and we would go into a committee of the whole in the House and consider the committee substitute to the appropriations bill and then the, we'd, we'd then vote on the committee substitute and approve that and then go into the full House and pass the budget. Um, and you would see the, the House version and then that would go over to the Senate. And those tracking sheets would also show you what the Senate did, which was uh, th there would be a lot of different agendas on the Senate side. And then uh, ultimately a, 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 uh, a conference committee would be appointed of the, of the really the top leaders on, on, uh, in the legislature and in the party and in the, and in the Senate, uh, on the Senate and the House side to, to meet together and iron those out. And those battles in the conference committee was something to watch because... Uh, uh, but, I, but because, but first of all, because of the political drama, uh, the House would take its position. It's three members of the conference committee. The Senate would take its position, and then they'd just have an impasse and leave, and you wouldn't know when they'd come back. But they'd be talking by phone. And uh, but the beauty about Georgia's budgetary process is, is that you have to have a balanced budget. You can borrow money through bonds, but you have to balance your budget. And I think the excellent example that Georgia shows. In our, in our democratic years and, and even continuing into the Republican years now is that we, we can't leave and say we don't have a budget. 
Uh, you have to come to the table and you have to have an end decision, uh, an end, E-N-D, decision, so that you can govern. Georgia's budget has to be balanced, and you have to, you, no matter how strongly you feel on any particular side of a budgetary issue, at the end of the day, you've got to have a budget passed. That's a constitutional mandate. Mm -hmm. and, and Georgia has never failed to do that, and I think it's a, it's a good example for our whole nation. But on the last day of the session, normally? Well, it is. And... Um, you know, I, 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 I've made observations that I, I think were truisms about how the legislature worked. And on the, on the last day of the session, there was such a volume of legislation going back and forth. I don't know, I don't know any way that you get around that when you have a session uh, dependent for, uh, of, of, a, of a time limit, dependent on a time limit of 40 days. And so much legislation was going back and forth, including the budget that it's hard for each individual member, no, no, let me rephrase that, it would be impossible for each individual member to say they really knew where every issue and every budgetary item and every bill that was going on stood at any particular moment. And at that point, I, I, I studied law and went to, went to the University of Georgia because I love the legislative process. And it's that point that you see that the beauty of, uh, of, the, of the legislative process work that the rules in the Constitution and the rules of the House and the rules of the Senate provide a mechanism to get it done even in a, in a madhouse of a vast number of bills going at the same time. And it depends on everybody doing their job and everybody following the rules. Now sometimes there's big slip ups in that. You'd, I remember on a, on a driving issue one time that Governor Miller was very interested in and, and the House was opposed to. Uh, it was defeated on one bill in, in what would be called an omnibus bill that took a lot of other bills dealing with driving issues. The issue was defeated in the House. It went over to the Senate. The Senate put it back in. And I don't know, I, don't, I wouldn't say intentionally, but when it came back over, including the, the provision we had defeated on, in the House side, when it came back to the House, the Senate version came back. Um, the House, with the recommendation of a chairman, passed the Senate version and including what, included what we had we had defeated. And of course our idea was uh, that, well, we'll be back for the first day of the next session and repeal that, what we I mean, voted against. And Governor Miller sent word uh, indirectly that you better have enough votes to override a veto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but no, the last day of the session is, is tough. And I'll have to say this about the legislative process. Um, Changing laws that govern people's lives ought to be a deliberate process. Uh, everybody who just has an idea on, that, on, on one single day and puts it down on paper and signs it and introduces it doesn't mean it ought to be a law. I, kept a, I realized after my first session that things you had said all your life, it ought to be a law. Now that you could pass a law, you couldn't remember the first one of them. And so I kept a, a file at my desk, and when a constituent would make a recommendation about a law, or I saw something in the code that I thought needed correcting, or I saw a good idea from the National Legislative Institute's um, uh, studies, I would put it on that list of, I called it my it ought to be a law list. And then before the session, I would go through that list because you couldn't possibly pass all the legislation that you'd hear about and prioritize it and, and introduce it. Um, but whether it was me or anybody else, an issue really needs to be tested out and thought about. And you, you know, I said about no, you couldn't do a consumer issue without having just a vast amount of opposition. But you ought to hear from the opposition. You ought to know how it affects everybody. And it ought to be a tough thing to change the law. And it is a tough thing to change the law. And, but part of, the, part of that, that madhouse on the last few days is that the legislature has 40 days, but it's really slow during the first part of the session. Uh, things move very slowly, th and you'll have everything go into subcommittees and then committees, and then um, and, and the, the, one of the things we complained about, you didn't have regularly set subcommittee hearings or agendas. I think that's corrected now. Uh, but the process is really slow, and then as the session runs out of days, the process starts getting faster. And I mentioned that there was such homage to the committee system, and it had to be approved by the committee, a, leg a piece of legislation, to go out on the House floor. And even though it's approved by a committee, it's still got to go through the Rules Committee. And once it's passed in the House, it's got to start all over in the Senate. 
And what you would find that, that pieces of legislation that had gone through that whole process and had been so delicately uh, worked out, uh, if it wasn't passed finally in the same version by the House and Senate by the last day of the session, you could see quick changes going back and forth on, on substitutes and amendments and, and putting another bill on another similar bill that had not gone through that committee system and not gone through that, uh, that studious process. And so uh, the system works on the last day of the session. It works for the budget. It works for legislation. But, the, but part of the reason it's so, um, um, it's so slow, I mean, it's so, it's so overwhelmingly, uh, such an overwhelming day as far as the volume of work you're doing is because the process is slow early on. And I think in reality that it, then, and probably now, that it's slow in, in, the, in the early parts of the session because, as I observed earlier, um, not everybody has a grasp on everything going on in the last few days of the session. But I think the, the leaders, the leadership, the people in leadership roles had their eye on the big issues that affected Georgia. And, uh, and I think that dragging that process out to the last days let, lets that influence of the leadership and the knowledge. I said earlier that uh, knowledge was power and the control of knowledge was more power. I think the knowledge of where the bills were on the last day of the session and what had a consensus of passing, uh, I think that, that helped give le leaders control of the legislature then and now. Mm -hmm. Now let's turn to reapportionment. You were on the reapportionment committee I don't recall how many times we were reapportioned, but it was many. Some by the courts, some by the legislature. Uh, tell us about serving on that committee. Well, my appointment, again, I had put it on my list as request to Speaker Murphy uh, for my second term, but it was way down the list. And, uh, and I mentioned to you earlier that I was somewhat disappointed in not getting the rules or the Appropriations Committee. I will say this uh, before I go on ab about reapportionment. Uh, several years later, even after the Speaker's race between DuBose and, uh, and, and Speaker Murphy, I did make it to the Appropriations Committee and served a long time there where I did, as I mentioned, had a wonderful several years working with the university system. And uh, during my, my uh, latter part of my service in the legislature, I also made it on the Rules Committee. So I finally had, but I always kept the reapportionment committee. Uh, uh, once I was on there, it became apparent to me two or three things. Number one, about the process, and number two, about me. I was the freshman representative out of all the Democrats in southwest Georgia, and we were going to lose three state representatives from that area because of population shifts to metropolitan areas of Georgia. And uh, anybody in that, and all of, the, all of the younger members that lacked seniority were in that same situation. Uh, that our, our seats, our very existence as legislators were, were at risk. And so I realized that, that, that Steve Anthony was correct. It was a very good place for me to be. Um, another thing I realized was is that technology had, had a tremendous revolution at that time. The reapportionment uh, uh, services uh, organization that served the legislature through the University of Georgia at that time, you had basically dealt with hand-drawn maps in the past. And maybe you could come up with three or four different versions in, in a day or two to, to give people alternatives of what they wanted to do. But, uh, but the computer technology uh, that was used in the census of the United States and also that was available to legislators to draw maps, now gave you the technology to draw 10 maps in 20 minutes and to uh, uh, go not only, you know, the, the theory was you didn't want to split any county up. And if you did, you certainly didn't want to split any city up. And if you did that, you certainly didn't want to split any, any precincts up. But you had the ability to go down to a, a single block in the city and know the political statistics of that block and move it between districts and see how that affected various districts. Uh, to me that was fascinating and I, I uh, made it my mission to learn how to, to use that committee, I mean that committee computer system. I've talked to Dr. Chuck Bullock's class over here at the University of Georgia 
uh, several times over the years. And he always points that out, that uh, one, of the, one of the things about me was I learned how to operate the reapportionment computers. Now, our dear friend Linda Meggers, who was the who was and probably still is the leading authority in reapportionment in our country, was the head of the reapportionment services office through the University of Georgia. And Linda would add to that story that uh, I learned how to work the computer, but she never showed me how to boot it up. And one time I, it kept crashing and I kept turning it back on. And she and I are dear friends and always will be. But that lady was mad at me that day. She said I had about 10 versions of that uh, that program running at the same time and that it crashed the entire system and it took them hours to get it going again. <laughs> but, um, but that was something about th that I was learning. And later on I became the vice chairman of the committee after that session and, uh, and you're right. I, I don't think I can remember the number of reapportionments we had. We had the 92 reapportionment session and that was the, the drawing af of the districts after the 90 census. And then we had uh, Johnson versus Miller, or was it Miller versus Johnson versus Miller, that that threw the results out of that uh, 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 of that reapportionment, and we had to have a special session to address the court decision. And then we had, uh, I know at least one other session in which the court said, "Well, you got it almost right, but there's five or six different uh, areas that uh, that still don't work." And then I know in my own instance, in that court reapportionment, uh, ordered reapportionment session, uh, the, uh, the, the court stepped in and drew some maps and meddled in my district. By that time, I was vice chairman of the committee. <laughs> and, you know, I talked about years that we had issues with Speaker Murphy and maybe during, during the speaker's race and maybe during the last reapportionment year in 2002. But uh, I remember that Representative Royal and... Uh, and, and some others went in with the speaker and said, you know, they've, they've changed Ray's district in a way that just isn't good for him or the party or us or his constituents. And there was no reason. It was not one of the courts did this. And we had a ruling that, uh, by gosh, the courts had reapportioned it. The legislature still had uh, authority to reapportion again. And we had that happen in about three areas. I know that Representative Buddy Deloach and Representative... Uh, uh, Tillman, Reverend Tillman, had an issue there too. So we went back in after that and reapportioned about three districts to correct what we felt was the court's mismanagement of the legislative process. Um, and and then I had the uh, I, I was still serving as vice chairman during the 2002 reapp uh, well the 2002 reapportionment, and uh, that was a tough one. And uh, and so I, I served a long time there, and the. Beginning back in the in the early part in in the 1992 uh, reapportionment session, which was my first time of service on the committee, we had Bob Bob Hanner from uh, Parrot, Georgia, was the chairman of the committee on the House side. The rules were the House did the House reapportionment, and the Senate left us alone. The Senate did the Senate reapportionment, and we left the Senate alone. And we both battled about congressional reapportionment until we just hardly couldn't couldn't come to an agreement. Um, but um, the, the chairman and, and the House process was that we had committee hearings, usually joint committees with the Senate, all around the state of Georgia and had the local people give us input in how they wanted their districts, not only the legislators in the local area but also the people, how they wanted their districts drawn. And the, and the message was clear to me. And I had, when you're a, a, a law student and a political science student at Georgia and anywhere else, I'm sure, when you study the re reapportionment cases, you know at that time that the, 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 the basic mission was to uh, create geographically compact, politically cohesive districts that had commonality of interest with the people. And I was looking forward to seeing that done. And that was what the people all around this state asked for. But at the time, there were... Uh, in fairness to, to in, in, in a realistic look in history, the number of minority congressmen and minority uh, state representatives and senators were probably not reflective of the population of Georgia. And I, don't, I, I wasn't in the legislature when it happened, but I think that, um, that that resulted sometimes from the fact that the uh, places where the minority population in Georgia during the 70s and 80s 
occurred were more uh, uh, areas that were uh, specifically located in particular communities. And so if you drew a small a, a district around a compact area, that was a minority district and it elected a minority representative. But, uh, uh, but also you saw instances of, you, of using the minority population to shore up uh, white Democrats. Uh, and so what happened was is you had a, an overwhelming Democratic control of the legislature. But on the other hand, you probably didn't have a, a, a number of minority representatives and senators and congressmen that ref, or in women that reflected the population of Georgia. And it was at that time that, the, uh, that uh, a part of the minority caucus, and, and it's always, you always, I always try to be careful in how you talk about this because you don't want to sound in any way uh, uh, that, that you're making racial observations. The fact of the matter is, is that the, the group called themselves the Black Caucus that promoted a, uh, a, a plan that maximized uh, minority representation in Georgia. Uh, former Congressperson Cynthia McKinney was very active in that and probably the chief spokesperson. And to do that, going back to the technology, uh, the technology was used by the Black Caucus to draw districts and it seemed to abandon the theory of keeping districts compact. If you looked at some of those maps, it, it, and without being disrespectful to the principles behind the maps they were pushing, it looked like people had thrown mud at a map. Districts were connected by the corridors of highways, and you would have uh, house districts running for hundreds of miles simply to connect the right number of people to, to create the particular political outcome that, you, that, that the proponents of the plan wanted. And some of, the, some of those, uh, I think some of the motivations by some of the members supporting that plan were, were noble. And I think others were noble, but also motivated by uh, uh, political ambition. You, had, you certainly had people who were promoting the, that particular map uh, elected to Congress as a result. And, uh, and, and some still serve and some have done an excellent job and are very popular. On the other hand, you created districts that did not reflect uh, Georgia as far as looking at a map and knowing who your representatives or congressmen or senators were because you couldn't look at the map and tell where you lived. And, and we, had, we, had, we had a lot of uh, contentious hearings about those, uh, about those maps at the Capitol. And uh, the message that, that was giving, given to the committee was that the Justice Department was going to require a response to that map. And that was, a, a, that was uh, 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 I, I believe, during the, Bush, the uh, first President Bush's administration. And in any event, uh, the map had far more influence on the outcome than I thought uh, that the law uh, justified. I thought that uh, you did end up with more minority senators, representatives, and congresspersons. On the other, and, and, in, and as a result, and I think uh, anybody that was fairly describing the, uh, the realities of reapportionment at the time, the end result was if you took a lot of our, and this is statistically what happens, if you take a lot of your minority population and place it into a district to have a 60% minority district as opposed to a 50% minority district or a 40% minority district, then what you have by, by the effect of that effort done is the adjacent district has an inordinately smaller minority population that maybe that county has. And the realities of politics in the 1990s were that the creation of those minority districts created Republican districts next door. And so the end result of the congressional election was more minority congresspersons elected than ever. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the end result also was that the adjacent districts elected more Republican congressmen than, than right. ever. And even when Johnson versus Miller said, no, you cannot use race as the sole means of drawing your districts, that, that, that it can be a factor but not the sole means. And, 
And the testimony in that case showed that in, in many instances, race was the sole means uh, and reason for adopting some maps. That when we went back and made the maps uh, more realistic and, uh, and fairly drawn, incumbents tend to get reelected. And so I think that reapportionment in 92 and the first election has had an, a, a domino effect through Georgia's congressional de de delegations to this day. Uh, but you have hinted earlier that uh, one of the objectives was to protect the incumbents. Is that not true? When you get, you know, I, I started off, yes, the, uh, uh, the certainly every member, uh, no matter how nobly purposed they may sound, looks at the reapportionment process, I think number one is what's going to happen to my seat. And we heard from, and we heard from and rightfully heard from everybody about how they wanted their district to be drawn. The technical way it was done in the, in the 92 reapportionment session is that the staff drew the state into several sections. I think they were called Q sections. And uh, for example, in Southwest Georgia, I believe we might have been Q13. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's just say that uh, that, that area originally had 16 members as it sat during 1990. But now the area that was encompassed only had the population to support 13 members. And so you were going to lose three state representatives. And the rules we ha adopted in the House side was that you had to draw your district to fit into other districts. You couldn't just pass a district and plant it on the mat map because it has a domino effect. We also had the the other limitations that we just couldn't move the Florida and Alabama line in southwest <laughs> Georgia. So um, um, the, you, had, you had to draw your district and make it fit in a map that, that with everybody else's district. So you really had to, every member would go in. You know, I talked about learning to use the computers. Most members had to go in with staff members, and staff members' time was very precious and, and was hard to schedule. But the members would go in and would draw their, their best district for themselves and would literally have to draw the rest of the districts too to make it fit. And that created some dissatisfaction with your neighbors often. And, um, um, and the other rule was if you went outside of your area of the state, that like Q13 area, and, and, and it's, why couldn't you just grab about 40 people across that line? Well, you could, but that affected that area too. So if you if you cross the line of your region, you had to also draw all the maps for the other region too. Mm -hmm. And so the, the trick was, or the, 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 the task was for each in individual member, was to come up with a plan that frankly uh, you could accumulate a majority of the votes of the members of that area uh, to, to approve. So. It, it tended to be, and I hope that I, I'm, well, I hope I wasn't motivated that way, but the process tended to be a ruthless process. If you had 13 members, you had to take care of seven people and have seven votes to approve that, 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 that map in order to get it put into the statewide map. And that meant that there were going to be some dissatisfied people. And, and moreover, it's not that districts go away or members go away, it's that districts are combined. And, uh, and so long-term members would be placed in the districts with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, in our area, Representative Hanson Carter was in a district with, uh, with another legislator, and uh, that happened several, several times. And some people would, would retire after that. Uh, I was placed in a, a district in 2002 with my cousin Austin, who's now Congressman Scott. And, uh, I don't think they knew that I really didn't intend to run, but uh, I'd been there 14 years. But uh, he, he, they, were, they, they placed us in 2002. I say they. The process was different in 2002. We were in a district together. It was a democratically dominated district, but, and Austin served as a Republican. But uh, I was not inclined to run again, and I really wasn't inclined to run against a relative. And so the end result of that reapportionment was the Democratic district was represented by a Republican because I didn't run. In 2002, uh, give me your feelings about the uh, the party 
aspects of reapportionment. Uh, if I could, I, I, I served for 12 years on the reapportionment committee. If I, I've often thought about how would you invent a system to do reapportionment right. And that's why I stayed on that committee so long. I saw the absurdities of how some maps were drawn in the 19, in early 1990s with the, with the honest belief that, that nothing would be, and many of our maps, by the way, our best efforts, we didn't start out with the most, uh, most unusually drawn maps in 92. Many of ours was turned down by the Justice Department. But our, our end result, it was such a, such a process that I thought didn't serve people. I think people ought to be able to look at a map and say, you know, the map, first of all, looks reasonable. Secondly, I live here. And thirdly, this is my state representative, this is my state senator, and this is my congressperson. And you could not do that with some of the maps because you had to think about what precinct you lived in. And after we got through with the, with the multiple reapportionment sessions to finalize the, the 92 battles that again lasted well into the, well in, into the 90s of the various court decisions, I stayed on the, the re, most, of the, most of the rules in the legislature is that after you've served on reapportionment in the reapportionment session, you come off and get a better committee assignment. <clears throat> I was vice chairman by that time, and I did stay on the reapportionment committee, and my, my goal was I had great other committee assignments on appropriations and rules, and I wanted to stay on reapportionment to have another opportunity to do it right. We had a few windows in the 92 process that we thought we could come up, for example, with more reasonable uh, reapportionment maps for Congress. <clears throat> and they fell through. I remember one of our staffers one time said that they'd waited a decade to, write, to draw a map that, that was right. And that was one of the reasons I stayed on. I said, well, you know, we've got good court decisions now. We've got good rules to go by. The political ambitions have been to somewhat, has been served somewhat. We've had the effects on increased minority representation, increased Republican representation. Maybe we can go in in 2002 and now draw district maps that, that actually are geographically compact and politically cohesive and the people can understand. Uh, I, I spoke to a University of Georgia uh, uh, graduate class during that time and made that same observation that we were going to go through a process and this time do it right. Well, when we had the reapportionment session in 2002, uh, the, the maps that were promoted by the, uh, my own party, uh, and I think perhaps learning the lesson of 92 was, is that the incumbent persons in control of the legislature uh, could draw maps and if they could pass them, could affect the outcome of legislative races for years to come. And some of the maps we saw, for example, I'll use my district. I, I represented originally Worth, Turner, and Lee counties, and, uh, and my district changed to the line of the district in the first version that I saw in 2002. The district line went in front of my law office, and we're, uh, we're about, um, about 80 miles north of the Florida border and my district uh, trickled down all the way and almost to the Florida border in one of the maps I saw. Not only would it be uh, not the right thing to do, it would be impossible to serve in a district in a part-time legislature. You'd literally have to go to every city and county committee meeting in six counties uh, to, and you'd, you'd, be, you'd be gone all the time. Um, that, that process um, uh, continued on in 2002 in which the I think the Democratic Party was, was trying to, uh, and I, again, strong and devoted and continue to be a member of the Democratic Party, but the reality was is that demographics were changing in Georgia and the strength of the Republican Party was increasing. And some persons had made the decision in, in the party hierarchy to, uh, to draw those maps in a way to preserve the control of the Democratic Party of the legislature through the 2000 and, uh, uh, two session for the next decade and uh, um, because for one thing uh, I think you see statistics now showing if you really look at the population of Georgia now there has been an upturn in the Republican control of the House and the Senate and the governor's office for years dominating control again in just a period of, of, of a few a relatively few years 
but the population of Georgia is changing now and, uh, and continues to change. You're having increased minority populations in Georgia. Uh, you're having increased Hispanic population. <clears throat> and if you look at the election returns on, on statewide elections in the presidential race from uh, Bush and Gore on to now, as the minority populations in Georgia and Hispanic populations grow, the margin between statewide Democrats and Republicans are narrowing. And I believe that it is fairly well conceded that Georgia is uh, on its way to being a, a swing state, again, statewide. Purple. Uh, purple state is what it's called. And uh, it may very well be this election. I hope so. Yeah. But in any event, the party did have a, the, I, I think the Republican Party had a role in the 92 session in being a teammate of the Black Caucus to draw, to draw those maps and create Republican districts. Right. The Democratic Party uh, learned that lesson and in the 2002 session tried to make the same efforts and were roundly criticized by the Republicans for doing the same thing the Republicans did in 2002. Uh -huh. We call that lack of institutional memory. <laughs> and, uh, but the maps uh, were, were still bad looking in 2002. And, uh, and there was, I think, a public backlash against that also. And I think the public finally said, no more. And I think the Republican Party had the best of all possible worlds. They had, uh, uh, number one, were able to criticize the Democratic Party for doing the same thing they did. Number two, turned it into a political issue and had enough party shifters in the, after the election that changed the control of the legislature very soon. And the, and the governor's race uh, turned out in, in, in the Republican favor too. So yes, party, party is involved in the, um, when the Democrats control the legislature and the party was involved in the last reapportionment session. If you look closely, as long as I did, you can still see the influence of party politics, of let's, you, you, can, you can almost tell, let's draw this, this district so that this potential candidate is not in this district and to strengthen up and support the incumbent here because he's in the leadership. The Republicans did a, very, a much better job of making the, the maps look good, even if motivations were incumbency and uh, political protection. And by the way, the courts say that, you can, that that's valid. You can protect incumbents, and you can, and you can consider politics. Uh, if, I had my, if I had my druthers, the way reapportionment would be done, we would take that, this vast and, and certainly increased computer technology now that we have as compared to 92 and tell the computer to take the current districts, number one, and to figure out the, uh, the, optimi the, the optimal district size, the, the population you, you had. Protect the incumbents, put that in the program. Um, and it's because you'd, you'd have to do that to get it passed. And try not ever to split a, when I talk about splitting cities and counties, of course a metropolitan county and a metropolitan city it has to be split because of populations. But in the rural areas, don't split, split the small counties unless you have to. Don't split the small cities unless you have to. And let the computer draw that map that does all the things that you'd think you'd need to do, including protecting incumbents, including taking into political considerations of leadership, and see what map you ended up with. And use that map <clears throat> as a starting place. That that map had to be introduced in both houses. And then the legislature could go back and do anything it wanted to. It's not going to give up its, its authority to draw the districts. Um, but at least the people would see the, what could be done and I think could ask the questions, why aren't you doing that? Mm -hmm. Also, I, and I don't know that I have the answer to this, you, you talk about maybe a, a commission. I don't know that that's going to help anything because you, the question is who appoints members of the commission. Uh, I am troubled somewhat, even though I've never been in Congress, of the process that the Georgia legislature, the House and Senate members, uh, write the, the congressional maps. That creates, that creates wars that perhaps don't need to exist, doesn't need to exist, but I don't know how you'd do that better. If I were Congress, I'd probably take that authority back, but uh, I, I, sometimes I think it's don't rock the boat. We sure did hear a, a lot from our congressmen, though, during reapportionment of Congress, sometimes that you hadn't heard from before for a long time. Yeah. Ray, you had a very successful legislative career. You passed plenty of meaningful legislation. What are some of your favorite bills? Well, to tie the, my legislative activity into some parts of our earlier story, um, 
<clears throat> it occurred to me, and I'm jumping a few years ahead, and, and certainly I, the speaker's race only, it was 92. I think I uh, may have told you that uh, Speaker Murphy and I talked about it once and after the race and said, we won't talk about it again, and we didn't. But I will say <clears throat> that coming up to the Biennial Institute following the, the speaker's uh, race in which uh, DuBose uh, didn't win, that, um, that you, every, anybody in that position would have been a little apprehensive of what the, what's it going to be like. Because historically, I think when Al Burris ran against Speaker Murphy, uh, he was ostracized for years. I think I didn't know that Denmark Groover and others would do, and I, I, you know, I think I should include Terry Coleman in that group too, who really worked to keep us a part of the Democratic Party. We were we were still going to be Democrats, but to keep us a part of that, the the the, the process of the legislature. We didn't know that at that time, though, and um, um, so when we came up to the Biennial Institute, it, there was a little apprehension of of how uh, the leadership would treat us. And um, it, was, it was a coolness, I think you'd have to say. Um, but I decided at that time <clears throat> that um, I needed to be a productive legislator anyway. And so I went to my resources, the National Inst Legislative Institute, and looked through for a lot of good ideas of issues I'd heard addressed. I went to my It Ought to Be a Law file. And I introduced in 1993 more bills than I introduced before or since in that single year. Um, and uh, I think I wanted to prove to myself, and if necessary in an election, I wanted to prove to my constituents that I could pass legislation. And so <clears throat> I told you that Governor Miller was very gracious to us about the out of the emergency fund and funding projects I needed. But that year I passed more bills, and I think it had to do with the committee assignments and the volume of bills I introduced, and I introduced them early. I mentioned earlier on that as the, this process is slow to begin with, but if you have your bills ready to go when the, when the legislature started and they were basic bills, you could get them on through in the early part of the session. Uh, a lot of my bills were assigned to Chairman Billy Randall's judiciary, special judiciary committee. And Billy treated us just like the same colleagues he'd always treated us like. And almost all of my bills got to do pass recommendations and got to the House floor and got passed. I only ran into one bill one time in, uh, in uh, Ways and Means that Doug Teeper and I were there and both of us had bills there. And when we got through with the calling of the, uh, of the calendar, we noticed that uh, Chairman Dover had not assigned our bills to a subcommittee and we pointed that out to him and he told us that that was right. And we understood what that meant. But that was the only time I ever saw that. Um, I will mention one other thing about that speaker's race before we go on to the election of 1992 and DuBose Porter's decision to keep that within the Democratic Party probably had a, uh, both of those things had an impact on who would be speaker. Number one, you had a certain number of committee chairmen already and that was a certain number of votes that Speaker Murphy was going to get because these people owed their offices and their positions and their, and their offices in the state capitol to his appointing them. So he had those votes. Unfortunately, in the election, um, the um, Democrats lost positions in, in that general election. And therefore, because there were fewer Democrats, the number of votes that Speaker Murphy already had was a bigger majority, I mean, a, a bigger uh, number in the Democratic caucus uh, than uh, than it would have been had we had all of our Democrats winning. Also, I don't know that I don't know that DuBose was he tried, but I don't know that he was successful in making the speaker's race a race in the local elections, so that people would ask their uh, their candidates for the Democratic nomination, "Who are you going to vote for for speaker?" Um, then the other thing was there was a substantial number of votes that went for DuBose, uh, not nearly enough to win, but a large number of votes that went to him in the election. And certainly enough, with, and I think, with, as I recall, with the Republican members, that the votes that uh, DuBose Porter had plus the Republicans probably could have elected the Speaker. But I mentioned to you earlier that uh, I think Denmark Groover knew that too. And he walked straight to me and said, let's put this at an end right now. So those were some other things about the Speaker's race I wanted to get back to. Um, on, on the legislative end, though, uh, I, enj I enjoyed being in the legislature. I, I, 
I told you earlier that's probably why I went to law school and majored in political science was to be in the legislature. I loved the legislative process from the time I was in high school in the youth and government program. And there was nothing more interesting or fascinating or challenging that I've done to this day than the ability to take an issue and, and make it into a law and work it through that very complex uh, system that uh, it, it can work so very well. And so every year I would try to uh, identify the issues I've told you about that I thought either were needful in my district or in some instances some ideas I saw other states had used. And, and so I came up and, and, and drafted from scratch some legislative initiatives that I was very proud of. Interesting results of those efforts though. For example, one of the most complex bills I ever dealt with uh, I had just seen some other states make some particular efforts in the area of rural economic development. And I told you at the, at the first of the interview that, that I was from an area and still am from an area that has one of the uh, biggest unemployment rates and, and, and toughest economies that we see in Georgia. So I felt like I wanted to keep my promise to my constituency and that is to hit the ground running being a, a state representative. I, one of the things I could never uh, abide by and still can't when you hear the stories told with a smile on the face that when somebody is elected to the legislature and they go to Atlanta they're told that they for their first term they need to just sit back and listen and not have anything to say and and learn the process. Uh, in today's society I don't think the people elect people to do that and I think that you need to go with the idea that that you have things to learn but you need to go and try to work work at those things to begin with. And so I had seen another state deal with rural economic development and I took that as an, in, an incentive and wrote up a bill called the Rural Economic Development Act. And the premise behind that bill, uh, and I had to really work that bill to get it passed, but it got passed the House and the Senate. It was a very long bill and it was to use the growth strategy studies that every um, community in Georgia was supposed to be doing. And in the bottom 25% of the counties, which played a role in another one of my bills, that, that we would take the premise that in all of those counties there were facility shortages, that there were things that, that those communities needed to attract jobs uh, that, uh, that they didn't have the funds to build, uh, whether it be recreation for uh, people who were bringing their employees to the community for their children to engage in, whether it were enhancements to libraries, whatever it was, that we could presume in those bottom 25 percent of Georgia counties that there were some shortages that were not attracting businesses. So what do you do? They don't have the tax base yet to, to develop those, um, those facilities. And if they don't develop those facilities, and as we discussed earlier, if their people leave and move to Atlanta or move to the metro area looking for jobs, you're adding to the economic burden of urban Georgia. So the premise of the bill was if you provide some of the facilities that are needed in these areas that that the people could stay at home and work at home and attract the jobs. And it was, the, it was a, uh, a, a studied way of providing grants to those areas to build facilities. And what the local governments would have to do would be develop their growth strategies program and tell the, tell the state what facilities they needed in an ordered list that was required by growth strategies. What, what are your shortages? And in the bottom 25% of the counties that Georgia would fund a million dollar grant to each of those counties. You know, that sounds an awful, like an awful lot of money, but we're talking about 40 to 50 million dollars. And in, a, in, a, in an 18 billion dollar budget, it's a relatively small amount of money, but would make a tremendous impact in those communities and wouldn't be pork barrel, but rather would be a studied process of what these communities needed to, um, to develop industrial attraction. I got that bill passed through the legislature and it's still on the books now. But the problem is with so many good ideas in the legislature, I got the bill passed through the session, I got it signed by the governor and the House and the Senate, but to my knowledge it's never been funded to this day. Mm -hmm. So it's still there sitting waiting to do its good deeds. Maybe there's somebody that will hear this and go provide <laughs> some funding. <clears throat> Perhaps the, the most complex uh, uh, bill that I ever dealt with though had, a, had an interesting history. Back to the issue of economic development. I believe it was my, it's probably my second term. Um, well, it, well, Governor Miller was already governor. So um, 
We had the jobs tax credit program in Georgia that gave a $500 tax credit, and it's tremendously expanded now. But at that time, it was in its fledgling stages. To the bottom 25% of counties in the state of Georgia, as determined by the Department of Community Affairs, two of my counties was on that list. And that $500 jobs tax credit program was to say to, to businesses, we'll give you a, a complete credit off your state income taxes if you'll bring a job to this community to, to help be an economic incentive. South Carolina had been doing that, and what we had heard was from every study that, that I read was that other states were having these incentives and that Georgia had nothing on the books to compete with them, and we were losing jobs uh, right and left to the other states. But we already had the, the $500 jobs tax credit program. The jobs created, though, were limited to the type of jobs that could be created. And what was happening is, even with that tax credit, we weren't attracting in those bottom counties additional jobs. So I thought what we ought to do was expand the type of jobs to any job created. If you create five jobs, you are qualified for the tax credit, even if it's a McDonald's, if it's, if it's a small business, whatever it is, if it's a job and you're paying people and, 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 and you're returning your income taxes and creating revenues for Georgia, then you qualify. At the same time, I was not aware that the Miller administration was involved in trying to recruit uh, a, a uh, agribusiness to South Georgia. And the place that was being concentrated on at that time was in the next 25% of Georgia counties. Not, not the bottom 25, but the next 25% of the counties. Governor Miller, therefore, in his administration, had a bill that was proposed to expand the jobs tax credit program to add additional counties. So I had my bill in, and he had his bill in through the floor leaders, and I went to see him and said, Governor, if you add additional counties to help them, you're taking away the advantage we've already given to the bottom 25% of the counties. And so he said, well, he, he, he needed to add those counties to attract that industry, and he had to. So what could we do about it? And I went back and looked at it and made the proposal to him that we indeed did add those additional counties and added a $500 jobs tax credit for them, but that we increased the jobs tax credit program in the bottom 25% of the counties to keep the advantage that we had given to them. And anyway, we came to that compromise, and I was very honored that he, it was a long and detailed bill when you're dealing with tax credits and who qualifies and the Department of Community Affairs. And um, he asked, would I be willing to carry it since it was my bill, and he didn't want to, he was a very good friend and didn't want to take my bill away from me, would I carry it for the administration? One of, one of the bills, I can't, one of his books, I don't remember which it was, uh, had one of his status of the state addresses in it in which he said that uh, he was looking forward to us passing the bill that I would be carrying. I was honored about that. Anyway, I carried the bill for the administration. We, uh, we, I, I developed um, uh, memos that I distributed to the, to the, to the House and Senate uh, committees and the, and the members on the floor, carried in the, in the, um, in the House floor. Uh, had a little bit of a controversy. I remember the uh, Speaker Murphy and, and the House leadership were all always uh, careful custodians of the state's budget. And that, that was good, and that was a good for our state. Governor Miller was too, but um, if anything, uh, Murphy and the leadership in the House were even more conservative about the expenditure of state revenues. And they were a little hesitant about an unknown tax credit. The studies had shown from other states that we would earn back two to one the dollars that we lost uh, by the revenues that, the, that the, created, the jobs created would produce. But in any event, when I got finally this bill after long battles and long revisions to the House floor as I took the well, and I'm a House member, the Speaker says, Mr. Holland, <clears throat> yes sir, he said, there is something that has come to my attention, he said no more than that, that I would like to consider somewhat further before we have a, and they had, the, the governor had the votes that night, that I'd like to consider before we act on this legislation. Would you uh, please consider uh, uh, postponing action on this bill to tomorrow uh, at a definite time? And it seemed to me to be an appropriate request. And uh, in, in any event, it seemed very awkward to say no, <laughs> and probably I thought would hurt the chances of the bill passing. So I said, Mr. Speaker, I'd be glad to do so. 
and the bill was postponed, and I got to go. Zell Miller and I had been friends since I was in, uh, in high school, but I got a call to come down to the governor's office, and he was very uh, pointed to me why in the world that I had agreed to postpone the bill when he had the votes um, on, on, on that night. And I said, well, Governor, it seemed like the fair thing to do. And he, he was very concerned that uh, I had not proceeded to, to, to put the fight out there that evening. But I assured him that, uh, that the bill would pass the next day, and it did, and it passed the Senate. And I'm very proud of the result and the jobs that that's created around Georgia. I don't know that tax credits have had the effect that Georgia has wanted in that program. We continued further to deal with that program in years by increasing the tax credits tremendously and adding many more uh, uh, counties to the list so that Georgia had it all over the place, but we still, I mean all over the state, in all of the counties, but we still used the, tier, used the tiered system to keep the advantage to the to the counties I represented, and I was proud that that stayed in there. But so many other states have adopted that and, uh, and other tax incentives and job incentive programs that you wonder in comparison if it still has the effect it might have had back then. Um, one of the legislative battles that was in somewhat, in some ways humorous and was not just a bill I introduced, but if you ask me about what effects uh, of things I did in the legislature that might have affected people that I represent the most, it had to do with long distance. It is almost astonishing when I can reach in my pocket right now, and I did turn my cell phone off and turn my cell phone on and call anywhere in the world. It's astonishing to realize that uh, on landline telephones <clears throat> back in the early 90s that you could call from Atlanta to Alabama and make a local call. But there were some places in Georgia that you couldn't call from the, from the county seat to another city in the, in the county and it not be a long distance call. And there was at least one city in my district that you couldn't call anywhere in the world that wasn't long distance. And so it was a very important issue to many of the South Georgia legislators that we do something about that. And it was a multi-year fight. We passed a, year one, a bill one time that, that basically said that we were directing the phone companies to uh, expand the, the long distance service area. And basically we got the message back, <clears throat> we can't do that. Uh, the explanations are, have to do with the original territories granted to the phone companies, but it was not very responsive. And the second year we passed a, a bill that gave a deadline, and it didn't look like the deadline was going to be passed. Uh, it was hard to get that bill, by the way, through the Senate, and I remember there's a lot of interesting things that happened in the legislature. Representative Coleman, who became speaker later on, was very interested in that, and he was concerned that we didn't have the votes in the Senate, so we gathered up about as many members of the House that as there were in the Senate and went over to visit the Senate <laughs> while they voted. <laughs> and Lieutenant Governor Taylor was uh, presiding over a, a Senate that all of a sudden doubled in, its, in the volume of people on the floor, and he handled it with great graciousness, and the bill did pass. <clears throat> in the end of the day, though, it took a final technically correct bill for the third time. Uh, uh, Mac Barber, our great former public service commissioner and former state representative and public servant in Georgia, was very interested in that. And we ended up uh, with uh, legislation that said we would create a zone around each, uh, each um, local office or, or exchange. And that for, I think, I think it's, uh, it's been a long time, I think it's for 26 miles, any area that's touched by the circle around the exchange has to be local. <clears throat> An interesting uh, outgrowth of that was, though, that the battle had gone on so long and the phone companies were so tired of hearing from the legislature that we actually got, there was another twist on that. Under the Public Service Commission rules, the people who were in the area had to send in ballots as to whether they wanted to change. And with that bill in place, I did get a phone call from some of the, uh, some of the members who were dealing more intently with that legislation uh, as one of the legislators who'd been so involved with it for so long. Uh, pr particularly, I think it would be a disservice if I didn't mention uh, a much older member, Representative James Beck out of Valdosta, who fought that issue forever, I'm sure. Uh, but um, anyway, I got a phone call uh, from one of our leaderships saying, listen, the phone companies are really tired of this thing. Is there any area that's not being touched in your area that's going to be long distance free that you want to add to this ballot? They'll add it anyway, <laughs> just to have this issue over. But when you stop and think about that, 
and you stop and think of it, it seems like almost a funny story. But back to what you do as a legislator, and that is to try to make the lives of the people that you represent better and try to, to provide jobs. One of the basic things you study about how civilization has advanced is communication. And if you have a small community that can't call anywhere in the world that's not long distance, then nobody's going to put a business there. And, uh, and, and that long distance uh, expansion has, at least during the, last, during the decade of the 90s and I think the first decade of this century, has uh, made a bigger economic uh, area in South Georgia because the communication uh, is so uh, more readily available for such a larger region. Now, uh, how will that legislation still have the same effect in the day when we call, uh, you know, statewide without any long distance cost on our cell phones? It's probably not. But for the time, uh, that was a crucial issue that I think had uh, a simple story but a, 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 a big effect. Um, um, one of the things that I, I think one of the other, I don't want my story to be the very well researched and complicatedly worded bills that were passed that, that didn't work out. But one of the things I worked hardest on was how we compensate our public officials. Uh, we have an unrealistic way. You know, <clears throat> the legislative service that, that people have is probably too long. But I don't believe in term limits. But both for the, for the individuals who are serving there, um, you know, you have some people that have served 20 and 30 and in some instances 40 years. Um, I served uh, for 14 years. And um, it takes you away from your business and your family. But it also, people continuing to serve that long, probably limits other ideas of other people coming in that never had the opportunity to serve because uh, they liked the incumbent and supported the incumbent. But, but whether, you, whether you think that our, our service in the legislature that people serve is uh, too long or too short, <clears throat> you ask about one, how many Georgias there were. There's certainly different Georgias about your service in the legislature. If you have a business, if you're a lawyer, for example, and you serve in the legislature, as a, which is part-time, uh, and you live in the metro area, you can go to the legislature in the morning, go to your committee assignments in the afternoon, go to your law practice and your business later in the afternoon and go home at night. I, I believe even, I believe your per diem compensation is the same during the session even if you go home at night or if you have to rent an apartment. <clears throat> On the other hand, a South Georgia legislature or somebody that can't commute back home uh, has to have a place to stay, whether it be a hotel or an apartment. Uh, Today, with technology, you probably have more interrelation with your office through the internet and email and such as that, but not in the 90s. And um, so service from a distance in our state legislature, uh, and, and, and also as you serve longer and your seniority increases, your, the time you need to be in Atlanta and should be in Atlanta to be involved in committee meetings and Oh gosh, the reapportionment session committee meetings just went on for weeks and weeks and weeks in the special sessions. I think by the time I left the, the, the General Assembly, I was, I believe, 29th in seniority. And it was taking about, uh, about half or more of my time. Uh, the, the salary is a very small salary. The expense account doesn't cover what you're spending for half a year. But, but it's public service and it shouldn't be uh, how you earn your income. But we ought to enable our citizens to be able to afford to serve. And so one of the things I thought about was how other states dealt with compensation of public officials. And I looked around and researched the, um, the way that Alabama and Florida and California and other states did, did, did compensation. I, know, I noticed in Georgia as a young legislator that every now and then we would get a report from a compensation commission. And, um, and one of the things that seemed odd to me was is that the Compensation Commission would make a recommendation as to what the legislature and the governor should make. And we would routinely turn down the recommendation of the Compensation Commission because it was bad politics to adopt a salary increase that was recommended, even if it was reasonable. And, and it appeared that our, that our adjoining states and other states were, had more reasonable compensation to our, 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 particularly our legislature. You've got, um, 
you know, our, our speaker and our lieutenant governor uh, and our even, but all of our legislators are vastly uh, making less than the department heads that are supposedly working for our state. Uh, and, and you get the impression sometimes that the department heads are glad to see the legislature leave. <laughs> but in any event, I took some of the best of all the other, uh, of the other states. And one of the things I'm very proud I did during my legislative uh, service, and, I'm, and this is bragging about somebody else, was I, I developed a, a good friendship and a, and a professional uh, reliance upon one of the legislative council in the legislative council's office, an excellent attorney named David Bundrick. David just retired. He was one of the best lawyers that we had working in state government. And to my knowledge, with one or two emergency exceptions, every bill I introduced in 14 years, David and I worked together on, and we developed and combined a constitutional compensation commission. And the Constitution was going to be amended to create a commission made up of people that did not serve in public office. That was one of the conditions. <clears throat> they would be appointed. It would be a nonpartisan commission. It was how the commission would be appointed. It had to be fairly distributed throughout the state. And there had to be representatives of all parties and, and all interest groups on that. And that compensation commission would meet uh, on, a, on a periodic basis and set the salaries <clears throat> of of everybody in state government from the government on down, the governor on down. And because it was a constitutional level commission, uh, the, uh, it, was, it had to be funded by the General Assembly uh, because that was the recommendation that was made by a commission authorized by the Constitution. There were exceptions in the constitutional amendment in case of a budgetary emergency or somehow that the funds were not available. It seemed to me and it seemed in other states that used something like this, that it was a way to get the politics out of compensating our public officials so that, again, we could compensate our public officials at a level that it allowed people to afford to serve, but not be the sole, mean, sole reason that they did serve. And it, uh, it, it, I remember the dealing with that legislation. It, it was near the end of the session because it was so complicated. Um, I got input from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and I remember when the Republican minority leader had some concerns about it. I frankly addressed everything he asked me in the, in the Constitutional Amendment. It was really a, I'm not saying that the vote on it was bipartisan, but the, uh, the, the product was. And uh, it got out on the House floor, and it passed the House floor, and it passed the Senate. And uh, to my eternal surprise, uh, our friends in the media didn't like the bill. Uh, some of my very good friends, uh, Dick Pettis, who worked so long for the Associated Press and I considered a good friend and one of the most ethical people in journalism, called me up and said, Ray, said, I just want you to know as a courtesy to you that we're really coming down uh, all fours against this constitutional amendment and, and criticizing the, the concept. I said, well, I, Dick, I don't understand it all. This is, this is a good government bill. It's something that's been studied and used. But uh, I think maybe there was the perception that somehow the leadership was trying to uh, slip a salary increase past the media. And it was nothing to that effect. In fact, the, the idea came completely from me. And it was passed, but it, but it had negative media around the state. And when the, when the, keep in mind that this was a commission that took away power from government and gave it to people who did not serve in elected office, average citizens, men and women who, who did, not, uh, did not walk every day as, a, as an elected official, and turned that power back to them to compensate how public officials should be compensated. And it nevertheless, I think because of uh, the negative media, failed in a very close vote in the referendum on the Constitution. It, it was so close, it was like 49.8 or 9 percent in favor and just, just enough against it that it didn't pass. Otherwise, we would have that as our constitutional provision now. Um, I, th I thought a funny bill that uh, you never, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that, that the old saying that no good deed goes unpunished. One time it was well known that I had some computer knowledge maybe as a younger member of the legislature better than some of our older members. Speaker Murphy one time said from the podium when they said, talked about the computers and, the, and, and a mouse, he thought that was what ran around his house when it wasn't clean. <laughs> but one of the most controversial bills I got into was when 
one of the members of the Rep uh, Republican Party, a, a good guy, but he was uh, a smart man, Mitch Kay. Uh, representative uh, had a he knew about computers more than I did and he had a web page way back in the early 90s <clears throat> and when you typed in Georgia House of Representatives the, the the search engines back then the site it went to had the state seal of Georgia and it was Mitch Kay's web page and he was very down on our, our, our House of Representatives leadership and it didn't seem to be right that that it looked like it was the official home page of the of the House of Representatives you could the problem was there was no official home page of the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I introduced a bill pursuant to the speech. said, Mr. Holland, you, you know about these things. Uh, put out a bill that doesn't let our state seal be used by, unless it's an official business, and that got to be very controversial. It did pass. The debate was the, perhaps the weirdest one I've ever participated in. We, we talked about technology and computers and Star Trek and Lost in Space, all in the same debate, trying to explain to the members what we were talking about. Uh, it did pass, but uh, when you stop and think about that, and I didn't think about it at the time, um, we, we had, and we had bipartisan help on that. It, it passed in a bipartisan way. But there was no way really to, for that bill, at least in its form, to match the constitutional free speech standards that are still available on the internet, and I, I believe a federal court finally knocked that down. Um, service on the in the House of Representatives, uh, if you if you did it right, the way I think, you, you certainly make great friends. But you 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 can use it as the as the best college or instructional courses that anyone has ever been involved in because you're exposed to so many issues and have such detailed explanation and can learn so much uh, that um, that even though my service is over uh, in the Georgia House for now uh, since 2000 and early 2003, I still think I'm a, a more knowledgeable citizen and a better voter and a better person because of the things I learned out there, out there and in there and the work I did uh, that, that not only tried to help other people but to help teach me things too. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the thing about a long service is that in 14 years, you uh, sometimes you get an opportunity to correct a mistake. And early on, I would, would realize that I would be taking a vote as a rural legislator and, uh, and maybe a, a person who, you know, the first time you're elected, it's just hard to imagine that you could ever get elected again because it was such a, it was such a, it's always so tough to run for public office the first time i was just so so blessed that um, that after my first election against a lot of people I, I was not opposed again during my seven years of service and um, um, but nevertheless in your early there's no question in your early votes you do think about the right thing to do and you think about the political effects on you uh, I always tried to have some principles to go by when you voted um, because sometimes you have to make tough decisions in, in short periods of time. And I always, I, 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 I can think I can say very honestly that I, on, on the significant bills that affected people uh, over the years, that I never mashed that green button or red button, that I didn't think a, a second about the fact of what a privilege it was and the fact that, that that button I mashed was about 40,000 people participating in democracy that way. Now that, that, <clears throat> that sounds a little, um, a little sobering, I suppose, but there were also just great and, and wonderful times there too. Um, some of the things that uh, I remember, uh, just, just casual stories, uh, we would sometimes meet late at night, and you've been there when this has happened, and um, it just didn't make any sense to break for dinner when we were still facing a midnight deadline. And it was always interesting to, to hear the speaker uh, say that they we're going to order hot dogs and hamburgers from the varsity. And those who wanted to order uh, uh, hot dogs would vote uh, red and those who wanted hamburgers vote green and the clerk would unlock the machine. And they'd count the, they'd count the orders to the varsity about the results of the vote on the machine. The, um, the, the voting machine and the technology that we had continued to improve. I'll talk about that in a minute and, and something else we're going to talk about. But in spite of the fact that we had the voting machine in the House, which 
Students of government in Georgia should always remember work differently from the voting machine in the Senate. The voting machine in the Senate, while the clock ran, was blank. But the voting machine in the House, you could see how the other members were voting. When the people in the Senate voted, and when the vote showed on the board, it was over with and locked. But as long as the clock was running in the Senate, you could see how the other members were voting, and, and it was not unusual to see uh, members look at the board and realize their colleague or somebody else had voted another way, and you saw, you saw light shifting back and forth all the time. But in spite of that technology, I, th I think one of the, uh, if you love the legislative process, it was so much fun to have a real old-time roll call. And when things started going too fast sometimes, and you could, uh, for, for the good times and the bad times with Speaker Murphy, he was a master of the House of Representatives and the procedures in there. He and Denmark Groover, I think, knew more about that than any of us could ever know. And you could just see at the right time sometimes he would, he would order a calling of the roll, and the clerk would call out each member <clears throat> uh, by, the, by the name, and we would yell out loud, A or nay. And, and it was fun to do that. It was fun to see how the House worked before you had the technology back in the old days. Um, I, some of the things that I will always remember from my service that are really sobering was being in Atlanta when we learned that the first uh, uh, air attacks had taken place during Desert Storm. It had been so many years uh, since uh, our troops had been in, in air combat like that and to, to realize that uh, people were losing lives on all sides at that time was a sobering event. Uh, the thing I will never in my life forget is we all have our stories about what, what happened on 9-11 on to us. And I was leaving the, uh, my apartment uh, in, it, in North Atlanta when the first plane hit the Twin Towers. And at that time you thought, uh, oh, this is horrible that, this is a, that there's been this accident in New York and some people probably lost lives in that. And then as I drove to the Capitol, more news came in. And as the time that I parked at the Capitol, uh, that was when the, the, the second plane had hit and then the plane hit the Pentagon and you knew that this was different. And I, I learned that just as I was walking into the Capitol. And I, it, it's hard to describe the feeling you have both as somebody involved in government, but also about what's going to happen to you during that day when you walk into that building. I, I thought about it for a second. You know, well, what are we facing as a, as a country? And I, uh, for good or bad, I thought this is what I do. And I, I went on in and and our majority leader, Larry Walker, uh, <clears throat> led us in the singing God Bless America. Uh, we were in a reapportionment session. <clears throat> and, um, and then it was a, it just very intent uh, memory in my head when I turned around and looked in the media gallery and literally saw when both towers fell. That's a, you know, to be in government, to be in a, in a participating in active democracy when you see something like that is such a, such a conflict. Uh, something else I'll remember always too also is in the special areas that's just, you know, it just makes you smile is on an anniversary, I, I believe it was maybe the 250th anniversary of government in Georgia, that we had a special session of the legislature in the old state capitol in, in Milledgeville. We actually went into session and heard an address by Governor Barnes and uh, um, so uh, there, there, were, there, were, there were times uh, that uh, that that not only were you a legislator, but it just, it just influenced the rest of your life. I suppose the, the fondest memories I have, though, is I mentioned my daughter, who's a junior here at the University of Georgia now in political science, wanting to go to law school and enjoys politics. Uh, she was literally born after I was in the, uh, elected to the House, so she was raised up every year coming to the House of Representatives and sitting on Daddy's lap sometime during the session. And, uh, I, I, I'd let her vote the machine. Sometimes I'd tell her which one to mash. But uh, and uh, it was, uh, I think, an interesting childhood for somebody to to feel very comfortable walking around and and in recesses sometimes even playing on the house floor. And that's a, a great memory of mine. I suppose that the special session too in Milledgeville might lead into a discussion of one other thing you and I have talked about. <clears throat> the the day of the special session was in, in Milledgeville at the at the old state capitol was so such a uplifting event and such a great memory. The legislators went down in, in a bus caravan with state troopers escorts 
There were bands playing. There was a reception at the old governor's mansion. Uh, governor Barnes made an inspired address at the old state capitol. You thought about the sessions that might have, they've done a great job renovating that place down there. You, you thought about what government was like at that time. And uh, <clears throat> I was sitting, I've mentioned my friend Doug Teeper before. When I heard Governor Barnes' speech that night, uh, I, I poked him, I said, is he gonna recommend changing the flag? And uh, we, we just had that passing conversation. Uh, and that did not happen that day, but it happened the next morning. <laughs> so if we want to talk about that, that's, uh, that might be a good introduction to that. Well, you, you were involved in those battles, uh, the first effort by Senator Miller and later Governor Barnes uh, actually changing the flag. Well, my memories of it go back to my high school days. <clears throat> and that is when I was... Uh, a student participating in youth and government, and our Secretary of State, Ben Fortson, gave me a, my own copy of the old state flag, which uh, has the Georgia motto, wisdom, justice, and moderation, and has the state seal on one side and the old historical emblem on the other side, and it's, it's folded appropriately like a flag in my office on a shelf as a great memento of mine. And, you know, I talked to you earlier about how your length of service, if you're if there's anything good about you, you ought to learn from the time you're there. And I remember during my first session that um, some members tried almost every year to change the state flag. And the, the state flag bill in my 1989 session came to state planning and community affairs. And I, didn't, I don't think I really understood uh, because I thought, well, you know, we've got a state flag that talks about wisdom, justice, and moderation, and it's got our history on it too. And Maybe it's a, a nice balance of where Georgia was and where Georgia is. Um, and so, um, so the committee just almost routinely turned that down, and I, it seemed to me to be the, the right choice. you know. I, um, but then again, Governor uh, Miller, uh, I, I guess it was uh, during his early administration, mm -hmm. proposed to change the state flag to what had been our state flag for more time in Georgia than any other time, and that was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, the, very similar to the state flag we have now. With the, uh, but 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 our flag up until the mid 1956s had been that flag, mm -hmm. uh, and what had happened was, and it's probably a disservice to the old flag, and it doesn't say anything about it or about our people, but rather the people who misused our flag. But some people were using part of the emblem on our old, old flag as a symbol of hate. That wasn't, that wasn't the fault of government. That wasn't the fault of the legislature. It was the fault of people who tried to turn a state symbol or a part of a state symbol into a symbol of hate. And that doesn't mean it was a symbol of hate and that it didn't have historical uh, proprieties of, uh, uh, to, to use. But in any event, more and more that became an issue of that a symbol that some people used uh, for a symbol of hate was on our state flag. And it became a national issues. And the questions became, were we going to have boycotts to our, to our uh, sporting events? And uh, more and more the business community in the metro area seemed to be interested in that issue. And Governor Miller um, uh, proposed the, the changing of the flag. And um, I remember, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> I remember watching those proceedings. Uh, and in, to, to some extent, that was going to be a tough issue, and I knew it. And I suppose that a lot of the members wouldn't mind not having to vote on that issue <laughs> if it was possible. Uh, interesting stories about that. I was, I, I was in, the, in the Senate Rules Committee when, the, when the, that flag bill came to the Senate Rules Committee. It was interesting to see who was coming and going and trying not to have to vote on it. It was also interesting, my, my longtime friend and Mark Gruber, he was so, you know, I've talk, talked about him so many times, he was such a great lawyer, such a great Constitution lawyer. And uh, if, uh, if there was anybody who was the master of the parliamentary process, it was him. And it was, uh, you've heard these stories too, Denmark Gruber would help you fix your bill to get it right, and then he'd help other people beat it if he didn't agree to it. Um, but he was a gentleman's gentleman and a representative's representative. Uh, and, uh, Mr. And, and at that time we lived in the same apartment building and uh, 
He took the well, and in, that was in the, in the first time Governor Miller tried it, and uh, proposed a compromise flag that he had drawn, he said, in his apartment the night before. And he, I, don't, I wish I had a picture of that still. It was an unusual looking thing. And half of the flag was white and half of it was black and it had some sort of symbol in it. And he talked about it being a, a compromise between all segments of Georgia society. And it was just bad looking. <laughs> <laughs> and that, everybody just sort of got quiet about his proposed amendment. And somehow the bill died down in the House. And I have always wondered if Denny thought that that was an issue that uh, wasn't right to take up at that time and maybe had diffused the debate somehow. But that bill didn't pass. And it, as you know, it became a, a big issue uh, in, <clears throat> I mean, some people tried to resurrect it up out of committee. And, and I think Governor Miller at that time was upset with them from the stories I've heard about trying to resurrect it uh, because it was having some negatives for him and it became an issue for him in his reelection campaign. And, uh, but he was the first one to have the, the, the guts to put that issue out. And then, as I said, the day after our special session in Milledgeville, uh, I walked into the Capitol and Representative Skipper, who was our, uh, one of our House officers at the time, I forgot what he, uh, he was a young man that we saved in the reapportionment battle, came up to me and s showed me this blue designed field and said, take a look at your new state flag. And uh, now keep in mind, this one was the one that was adopted that was blue background and had some kind of gold sealed in the middle and had a banner of all Georgia's former flags below it. And uh, my, my initial reaction was not for public comment, but since we're doing this historically, I said, well, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and he said, well, there are a lot of people who've worked a lot, lot of, very hard on this. I think the concept was that the business community, from what I heard, was that almost every lobbyist in the Capitol representing the business community was saying that the change had to be made, that Georgia had to have a symbol that, that even though some was beloved to some people, uh, couldn't be divisive to all our people. Uh, I had told the people in my district at, at public meetings and at, at, uh, at clubs that I spoke at at lunches that I thought that the issue of the Georgia flag would come up and that there would be a proposal and that we would refer that back to the people for a referendum to, to make a decision. I always thought it would be a, <clears throat> an interesting approach to make it a, a contest among Georgia's high school students to design a new flag that would, would, would represent all our people. As I understand the history of that blue flag, I think there was some, maybe an architect designed it or something. It was, mm -hmm. it was um, again, an, an odd color blue and an odd color gold. And I think the banner of all the former Georgia flags below that and the American flag was intended to make a gesture of homage to everybody's position, but it seemed to not have that result for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but the debate, it, it, but it was on what was called the fast track. We were going to have a vote that day. I had some constituents up from my district. I showed it to them. And uh, um, I, I, I went and sort of barricaded. You know, the one thing about the House floor that was interesting, many things were interesting about the House floor, uh, was that um, was floor access. And if you really needed to get away, unless you had the representative badge, that's one place you could go. And so I went down and I started writing a speech that I was going to make. And um, I kept, um, um, I kept to myself and uh, one of the governor's staffers said, you need to go talk to Governor Barnes about this. It, it, governor Barnes was and is my dear friend and he did a lot for me. And I've always been supportive of him and uh, I, I would, be today and uh, in all of his races and I think he was a great visionary studious Georgia governor and a lot of courage and a lot of uh, a brilliant man you know that's the kind of people you want in public office uh, absolute integrity smart uh, willing courageous willing to hurt themselves to do the right thing that's what you need but I kept resist I really didn't want to have that conversation <laughs> uh, and I because I was going to vote to change the flag but I was going to vote for a referendum because that's what I had promised the people I represented, that I would vote to let them decide. But the word was that there was some disagreement on whether we could have a referendum legally or not. Now I'll tell you from 14 years of perspective uh, there, 
Uh, and that is, again, what you call institutional memory that sometimes I think some of our members lack today. They maybe have not been there long enough to see what was done wrong or right in the past and remember it's a way to do it again. But, but the opinion of whether the Georgia legislature could refer an act back to the people uh, for a referendum, it would change from year to year. Sometimes the legislative authorities and constitutional authorities said, you know, we need a constitutional amendment to do that. I introduced that one time. But then when I introduced that, uh, some of our scholars said, no, you don't need a constitutional amendment. Just put it on the individual bill and you'll pass that law and that law can be referred. And we were being told on, on the day of the vote on the flag, though, that there was dispute about whether we could refer the flag to, to a referendum to the people of Georgia. But that's how I was going to vote. I was going to vote for a change, and I was going to vote for the referendum. And the change was, I think, what the leadership had signed on to, but the referendum was not. But So I, it was one of those great days that I was going to make somebody mad at me, it looked like, <laughs> no matter what I did. But my friend Roy Barnes, his staff had asked me to go down and talk to him, and so I did. And I walked in and I said, Governor Barnes, I said, there was just some, there was some folks chuckling outside saying that you'd pull the best practical joke in the world, that you were teasing folks about changing the state flag. And he grinned and he rocked in his chair and he was at ease. He said, Ray, you know, <clears throat> he said, uh, this is what we need to do. He said, the business, in, business interest, he said, everybody, uh, we, we've, has, has been in telling us this is what we need to do. It's the right thing to do. We need to take a symbol that's divisive off the, off the flag. And, you know, and he, he made this comment, too. I think it's historically significant. He said, this is not something I wanted to come, come to me and not something I would have, uh, have, um, have initiated and not something I'm just, just desperate to do, but it's the right thing to do. And I admire that about him. He, he, was, he was not, the per, regardless of what any historical pundits may say, I heard it from him. He didn't invent it. He didn't decide to do it. He didn't ram it down people's throats. But it was the time and the right thing he thought, and he wasn't going to run from the issue. Uh, perhaps, and he was a good legislator and a, and a brilliant uh, uh, strate uh, person with strategy, but perhaps the error there was, again, just the, the, the design of it. It was not an attractive flag, and maybe the, and, and it didn't have any historical connection to our, our state other than the little banner. Whereas the one we have now is so very much like the, the, um, the um, flag that flew over Georgia so long. You know, from a personal political standpoint, some people think that uh, his timing was wrong. That it defeated him in the next election. That, it, that he probably would have won had he waited to change the flag after the election. I don't think Governor Barnes would, would mind me saying this. I, I was interested in a judicial position at that time because I decided to leave the House. Yeah. And I hated to, but it was a time I had to go talk with him. And so I, I saw him the week out, just a few days after the election and went to his office. And I remember two things he said uh, 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 in that meeting. One of them, I went in there, and I, I didn't know how to start that conversation. A great Georgia governor somebody who had gone on the line for, for consumers and protecting people from lending abuses and predatory lending and somebody that had, had great opportunities for the future and now wasn't going to be able to do that. And, um, and so I walked in, I said, Governor, I said, you know, um, I said, I tell you what, I said, you know, I, I've, looked, I've thought about yesterday and, or, or whenever it was and, and, and wondered about what happened. And, you know, there was a bitter race between Senator Chambliss and, and Senator Cleland uh, in, for the United States Senate that year. And um, some of the ads against Senator Cleland, I think everybody, perhaps including Senator Chambliss, and years later have, have said were, were unfair and, uh, and probably not the way that uh, Georgia politics ought to be. Um, and... Um, so I said, you know, with that kind of campaign that looked like it beat Senator Cleland, I just think the reality of it is is that people were not going to go in there and vote uh, for Saxby Chambliss and then turn around and vote uh, for you on the other party. And he shook his head and he said, no, Ray, we've looked at the numbers. And he talked about where the numbers came from. We talked about the fact that there had been some division between him and educators. He said, but when you look at this particular part of the state, I think he, I, I wouldn't want to say for sure, but I think I recall him saying the southeastern part of the state. 
and look at the numbers there and look at the, he said, I got more votes in the metro area than any Georgia governor in history, even in the Republican parts. He said, but when you look here and you see that my vote in this part of the state and, and see uh, how affected it was, that's where the election was lost and that was about the flag. And so he knew it. The other thing I would, I think that, you know, it's been my good fortune to be standing around sometimes when significant things in history has happened. And what, what he said to me on that date stuck with me forever. I've told my child and I've told other young people. He said that, that uh, we talked about the transition and, and how his family felt. And uh, he said that uh, one of his, I forgot who he said, was very, so very hurt and so very bitter. And we were talking about just a few days after the election and that he talked about he was already working with uh, Governor Purdue to make the transition. And somebody had said to him that they just didn't understand why he was being so gracious and cooperative about the transition. And he said that he, he, he said in, in hearing that, he said, Ray, my daughter heard it and I told my daughter that uh, how you deal with th things when you win is easy but how you deal with things when you've had a great uh, defeat says more about the kind of man you are or the kind of person you are than at the times of your great victories. And I thought that said a lot about him at that time too, that he was still, the, still and still is the noble and gracious fellow that uh, he always had been. Um, and uh, that flag debate was interesting in the House side about two other things. Uh, number one, I didn't get to make my speech. <laughs> Uh, the reason I decided how I would vote had to do, and I'd told this before, with a, with a kid in my office. I made it my, I remembered that I always gave a Georgia flag to kids that came to my office and came to the state capitol. Um, I remembered that Ben Fortson had given me a flag when I was in high school, and it's the same flag that I still treasure today. So when somebody came to visit me and was a page or some, or even if I saw a, a family wandering around the Capitol and I didn't have, you know, and I saw that they weren't really connected to anybody, I would give them a card and send them down to the Secretary of State's office. And I know Kathy Cox wondered why I was giving away all those state flags when she was Secretary of State, but she always did it. And I would keep flags in my office and when young people would, uh, would, would, come to my law office or come and talk about things there, I would make sure if they didn't have a state flag, I'd give them one. And I had a family come to see me as a lawyer, a, a, a mother and a, and a father. And they brought their young, young child. And uh, he was so well behaved and he didn't have any place he could go. So he had to sit through a very long meeting and was well behaved. And just such an impressive young man. So when we got through with the business, any time that a a child has heard some legal business in my office, I always ask them if they have questions. I don't want them worrying about something that they might have misunderstood. And I said, well, tell me about yourself. I said, um, you know, do you make good grades? And he said he, he made A's and B's, and I told him to keep making A's and B's, and he'd earned the Hope Scholarship uh, that, mm -hmm. again, is uh, the, 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 the shining thing. I don't want to keep harping back at that, that we did in state government during my service, I, or maybe ever in Georgia, to give... To give all young Georgians uh, a future chance at, a, at, a, at education that they might not have had. Um, and um, so I told him, I didn't make that speech, but I told him, I said, if you, do, if you keep your grades, you'll be able to go to college and help your family. And, uh, and I asked him about his conduct and what sports. I said, well, listen. I said, you've been such a great guy. I'm going to uh, go, go to my office and I'm going to get you a, a present to take home with you to remind you about your state. And, and told him I served in the legislature. And I walked down the hall and I got, went to the office where I kept the state flags in my law office in Ashburn. And I got the flag, I kept several there, and I'm walking down the hall and I stopped and paused in the hall and hesitated to give the child the flag. And, um, and I stood there just quite a, quite a few seconds. It was the time when the flag was becoming more and more controversial. It was talked about in the media all the time. And I thought, you know what? I don't know if I ought to give this child, said to myself, this flag or not. Because what I left out of the story was that this was a black couple and a black child. And I, I hesitated in giving the flag to the child. And I thought, no, that's not right. So I went on in the office and I gave him the flag. 
And I told him the story about it. I said, listen, I want you to know this. This is our state flag. I've got one and I showed him on my shelf. I said, I want you to also know, I tried to always tell the truth to the people I represented, that, um, that there's controversy about this flag. And some people beloved it as a historic, love it as a historical symbol and some people feel like that parts of it has been used as symbols of hate by hate groups around the country. And uh, I said, my position on it is our state flag right now. And, and therefore, it, de it deserves its respect. And because it's our state flag and you're a state citizen, I want you to have it if you want it. And he did. And he wanted the flag anyway. But what I realized and what I was going to make, I was going to tell that story on the House floor. And what I realized that day was what was wrong with that story. And the, 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 the thing wrong with that story was not that what was on the flag or what a new flag might look like, but what was wrong with the story was that an elected official of our state hesitated to give a child of our state our state flag because of a symbol in what somebody owned the state flag and what somebody else had been using it for. And, and, if, and if I hesitated as a state official to give a child of our state a state flag, there was something wrong. Maybe I didn't have all the answers, but something needed to be fixed. And so that was the story I was going to tell as to why I was going to vote to change the state flag. And it was true, and I thought it, it deserved to be shared. And then I was going to vote for a referendum to keep my promise to the people to uh, let the people decide. And when the motion came to allow a referendum, the Speaker ruled it out of order. Now, he was a a good legislator and a master of the control of the House and the rules, and uh, I, don't, I don't know that I agreed with that ruling. But he was the Speaker and it was ruled, and we never got a chance to vote on whether to have a referendum on the House side. I don't know what happened on the Senate side, and so now there all of a sudden it's yes or no. It's change it or not without a referendum. And I remember thinking when I voted um, that back to the story there was something wrong that needed to be fixed. And if and I, I remember thinking, I said, if this is the last vote you ever took as a House written the House of Representatives, which is the right way to vote? And I voted yes. Um, now, uh, the um, I disagreed with not having a referendum, and not and having a referendum might have not had the flag adopted. Uh, but I will say that I had had a time in my legislative service for, for uh, then about 12 years that I had only had one negative article in the paper or letter written and that was of something about reapportionment to somebody I don't I was surprised I got a letter about that in the paper one time but there was a series uh, as you know of, of, of a lot of negative backlash uh, uh, against the legislators of all parties that voted on that mm -hmm. and um, uh, and I did have some negative publicity in the newspaper. And uh, I will tell this story. It's, it's a human interest story. I went back for the first time to make a speech at the Worth County Kiwanis Club, and I was nervous about it. It was the first time after the flag. I, I did very well for the district in the budget that, that, that year. I, I was able to have uh, a, a state facility was placed into uh, one of my home counties. I helped a civic center being completed in, in Worth County. and. Uh, and so I went back to Worth County to make my first speech, and I was a bit apprehensive. I, you know, it, it, I, I didn't get a lot of, I mean, there was probably three or four negative letters, but they're pretty bitter, you know. And, uh, and there was some postings on the Internet to get rid of these folks, and there was either, even one sign along Highway 82 and named uh, Rooney Bowen and Austin Scott and I. But I went back to the Qantas Club, and I never will forget that. One, a wonderful old gentleman who used to play for the Milwaukee Braves, the, the organ during the, 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 the breaks, uh, had moved to Worth County. He's deceased now, named Ad Lovejoy. And he knew I loved music, and he would, when I would uh, come to a meeting, he'd always play things I enjoyed hearing. And he would play before the, uh, the Qantas meeting. It was my turn to talk, but before I talked, Mr. Lovejoy stood up and said that uh, he... Um, that he wanted to thank everybody for all the many kindnesses that they had shown to him during the time that he was, he was ill. I did not know he'd been ill. And he went on a little while and he said that he was better now, but that he just wanted everybody to know that he appreciated so much the, 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 th the kind things and the kindnesses that they'd shown to him because for the last three months he'd just been to hell and back. 
And he was obviously doing very well. <clears throat> and I'm not a joke teller, but I saw an opportunity. And so um, I was a little apprehensive. And, you know, when you, when you think you're going to try to say something that might be humorous, you run the risk of falling flat on your face. But he had given such a sincere talk. I walked up to the podium in front of all those leaders of the community with just a somber face and said, well, it was good to be back, but I was a little disappointed to, to hear what Mr. Lovejoy said because I had, I had always known him to be a true and, and honest man. And you could just see the faces out there. I said, because Mr. Lovejoy has told you that he has been for the last three months to hell and back. And I said, but I want you to know that I've been in the Georgia legislature for the last three months dealing with the state flag. And Mr. Lovejoy wasn't there, and I assure you that was hell. And everybody <laughs> laughed as loud as they could laugh, and I, I don't think we ever talked about that again in, in, the, in that community. Um, interestingly enough, um, and I don't remember his name, he's a, deceased, he's a younger legislator, uh, I think from the Gainesville area, that died recently. Um, and uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, for historical reasons, to, to remember his name and give it to you. But he was a member of the Republican Party. He had a hard time getting things passed in the legislature, but he was always full of ideas. And I was on the Rules Committee, and before the, um, before the flag vote, he came over to me and he showed me. He's, he knew that I, I tried to have a reputation in the Democratic members and the Republican members of listening to issues. I know that my seatmate one time said uh, that um, sometimes Speaker Murphy said he couldn't decide from my voting record if I was a Republican or a Democrat because I tended to vote the issues instead of the party. And I thanked my seatmate. I said, you know, that makes me feel better because that's what we all ought to do. But I think I had a good reputation with the Republican members who maybe didn't have as much influence. And this young man came over and he showed me um, what has turned out to be the state flag now. Yeah. And uh, it had the old stars and bars, which again was really a conf old Confederate flag too. It had the state's seal. It had uh, In God We Trust on it. And he said, don't you, what do you think about this as an alternative to all this fight? And I told him, I said, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that that looks a, a lot better than the one we're working on today, but I don't see how you'd possibly get, get that approved. And, uh, and it, uh, and it has been interesting to me. I think George Hooks also became involved in the, yeah. in the new flag we have now. But you know what? I heard a lot of discussion take place on that day, that it wasn't about the flag we were going to adopt, but the flag that we replaced it with later on. I think the, the end of that story is that uh, twofold. Number one, um, um, the Republican governor's race had so much to say about changing the state flag and that election about a lot of members whose seats were lost. I, I, that's the year. It had nothing to do. My, my decision to not run was not involved in that, but I didn't run in that next election, but some Democratic members lost uh, probably mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, but, um, but nevertheless, um, there was a lot said about the flag and about uh, you know, having a referendum on that flag, and, and that really never happened, did it? No. It didn't return to the, to the stars and bars of the post-56 mm -hmm. flag. But you know what we did? Sometimes government just finds its way, and sometimes the right, the right answer finds its way. And I think we have a beautiful flag right now. Do, do you, you weren't there when Terry, was, Terry Coleman was speaker. I, I left the year before Terry. But I, I'm sure you know this. That vote on that flag we have today was 90, was 89 to 90. And uh, Terry Coleman had to cast the vote that passed the legislation. I, I don't know that I've heard that story. That's, that's true. I think if I, you, I tell you what, if you go to Reflections on Georgia Politics and listen to Terry's, and listen to Terry, he will explain to you that whole theory that, that the Speaker Murphy had told him when he became Speaker, son, always be ready to vote for a tie. There you go. You know. I, I think another thing ought to be told about that story too, though, and that is Denmark Groover's role. Denmark had already left the legislature, and uh, 
and he came back for the special honor that he so well deserved, and that was to be able to address the legislator, legislature and the House of Representatives as someone who had, uh, had, had already left. And I think more than anything, I, I don't, maybe the flag would not have changed, but certainly his presence and his, his comments in the Rules Committee mm -hmm. and on the House floor. And what Denmark brought was, was historical reality. You had a lot of dispute back and forth about why the flag was changed in 56. And people swore up and down that it was done for historical purposes and various reasons. And other people said it was an, a, a, a statement against integration and, and, and on the federal level. And, and there was a lot of dispute. But Denmark came in and he, um, he made the comment that in a very emotional speech that only he could do. And it's sort of like what I said, if you serve long, long enough, you get an opportunity to sometimes change things that you've done a different way. Mm -hmm. And he said that it, had, that it bore on his, his soul to uh, know uh, that the decision had been made back then because of negative feelings about citizens of a different color. Mm -hmm. And that, that no matter what anybody said, that's why the 56 change was made and that he was uh, happy that he had lived long enough to come and try to make that difference. And although I still, I, I, I love the flag we have today. It, I think it is beautiful. I think it looks good on the, on the, on the flagpole. I think it, uh, it is a good representative of what we really need in this state. And it has its historical significance. It has that wonderful state seal and the motto, wisdom, justice, and moderation. And it has in God we trust on it. On the other hand, uh, I thought it was very touching that at Denmark Groover's funeral, uh, that, that which I attended and many other legislators and Governor Miller attended and Governor Barnes came and put, put a copy of that flag in with Denmark in his final resting place that he helped change. Uh, I thought that was significant. Uh, you know, we mentioned the House floor earlier. Uh, I, think it, I, think, I, I think people are some, ought to be somewhat interested in what it's like to serve in that chamber. I just love that building. I love the state capitol. I, when I finally was on the Appropriations and Rules Committee, we, we also had um, a committee called the Policy Committee. Now, the, the Policy Committee didn't have a whole lot of functions to it, but it was a part of the House leadership, and I was at least probably one, uh, one more term away from being a chairman. And Speaker Murphy made me vice chairman of the policy committee, which gave me an office in the Capitol for, I think, my last four years, which was, it was neat for two reasons. It was next to the rules committee that made that, the meeting that morning uh, uh, helpful, but also um, it, it was just in a building I, I, I loved. And it was something special if you needed to go to your office to be able to take your electronic pass nine o'clock Sunday night and go in and go to your office. And it's a beautiful building and it's a treasure for our state. And the renovations that were done during my service, now I was not a part of that, others did, but to retort, restore the state capitol as much as possible to, the, to its original design and, and color schemes and uh, was just uh, a, a great investment for our state. It's a wonderful treasure and everybody should go. And the chambers in particular, I, I've, I've been in those chambers since I was 14 years old in some role. And I, 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 it, there's a certain reverence I feel to that room. I mean, I would sit there and look in the corners of the room uh, and just think about what, uh, what history had taken place in our state, good and bad. Uh, but the actual meetings of the legislature, I think it's significant to note here and, uh, that it is not, as you've seen throughout your career, uh, I think one surprise is it's not a place in which the great, so many of the great debates of what's going to go, happen in our state's future takes place. Um, you, you could see uh, Speaker Murphy, probably more than any other speaker, ram that gavel into the podium to the point he would break the, the, uh, the gavel stand <coughs> to, to maintain order in the House. And I think people watching on GPTV sometimes wonder about the the, maybe a disrespect being showed to the speakers and the process and the bills going through. Uh, so many, uh, so much of the legislation the General Assembly deals with is, is, is housekeeping legislation, making sure the code is worded right, making sure the administrative rules of our state are set up right. And uh, 
the, the big issues are not happening every day, all day long, and just because of the process and the way the leadership feels about it, it usually ends up taking place near the end of the session. But what you have every day is every day that is the one place, and this is some, I've, I've attended, I think, four Democratic conventions now, and the thing I've noticed is rather than a, and when, the, when, the, when there is a floor debate, on some great bill and some great issue. That's when it is really interesting to see the legislative process and the, and the debate taking place and then the motions being filed and the parliamentary procedure deciding which votes are taken first and which votes are taken second and which, which amendment is ruled out of order. That, that's fascinating and it, it's part of the beauty of the American and the uh, uh, legislative system and the way we've adopted it so very well in Georgia. I think for what is it said about democracy that for all of its flaws it's the best system anybody's ever invented and I think Georgia's state government is as well designed as anybody ever had. But when we meet on the days in the legislative chamber that's not the days we're considering those monumental bills. It's almost like the floor of a convention in which it's the one place where every member has that time that every other member is on the floor. And they might not see them during the day, and it's opportunity to share information and talk about other bills. And so you get a sense, if, if you've been in the legislature during a debate on bills, and you've been in a, a national convention when it's, it's mostly politicking and wheeling and dealing, uh, you, you notice, especially during the early parts of the session, that the, that the chamber sometimes look more, looks more like a convention floor mm -hmm. than, than it does a legislative chamber. And uh, although the speaker should, and rightfully so, hold whoever he is, uh, hold order, uh, all that discussion is not uh, uh, ignoring the process, but rather pushing the process through, I think. Uh, one other bill I mentioned earlier, uh, you, you talked about legislation. Uh, I, I don't think Georgia has ever succeeded in this, and I tried my very best on some fair campaign practices legislation, too. <laughs> And I think that's something that still needs to be addressed. People are so tired of negative politics. And within the, within the permission that the Constitution gives us to, of free speech, how can we run campaigns and do so in a way that, that deals with issues instead of uh, public relations, spin doctors' uh, ideas on what's the best way to cut into somebody else's vote margin? but that's not been done yet. Can it be done? Well, the, the, <clears throat> the way that it could be done is that the negative campaigning needs to stop working. That's, that's where it starts. When somebody gets so outrageous in the negative politics that the people finally say, enough, and we're not going to respond to this, uh, then that's when the PR people are going to say, oops, it didn't work in that last election. We don't need to do that. Reminds me, I heard uh, President Carter say one time that uh, negative campaigning is not nice, but it works. When I, you know, you've heard my admiration of, of Governor Barnes. He, he served in the, he, of course, he served in the Senate. He served as governor. And um, before he ran for governor, he came back to the House for a few terms. So we served in the House together. And he was on the Judiciary Committee when I did draft a rather elaborate Fair Campaign Practices Act that dealt with, for example, if you're going to quote somebody, at least that you have to give them notice. If you're going to use their image, that you have to let them know. There was just, we tried our very best to, to balance constitutional protections of free speech against Let's have a way that, uh, and, a can and a fair campaign practices pledge that you could throw in somebody's face if they'd promised not to do it and did. But when we were dealing with that bill, Governor Barnes, then a uh, House member, Representative Barnes, wasn't against me, but I remember him saying, you can't take politics out of politics. So <laughs> can it be done? Uh, I think the people have to do it, and that is to, um, to, to say it doesn't work. And, and, and what you said, as long as it's working, and then, then the folks that are going to continue to put twists on truths that uh, makes the worse appear the better cause. Mm. Um, you talked about earlier, and we talked about uh, during a break, um, one of the things you first talked about was reforms in the Georgia House mm -hmm. and how the, um, s somehow, you know, the, how the, the early on some of the members that I was closest to uh, became sort of uh, 
disillusioned with, with how the house was operating. And, and, and not to go back too, too much into the, the speaker's contest because uh, uh, as to, to, to tell this story right, we, we, Speaker Murphy and I had our differences during the, um, the, um, the speaker's contest. As I told you, afterwards we met again and said we would not talk about it anymore. I was never somebody that was uh, extremely close to him, but I'm a different generation and, and had a different background of, of political experiences. But nevertheless, we were both lawyers and we were both uh, interested in, in good laws and we were interested in progressive legislation, and I think we found a commonality of that. And uh, he, <clears throat> I think with the encouragement of other friends of mine in the leadership and then Mark Groover and some committee chairman, and I think Terry Coleman, always very supportive of me, and I think Larry Walker, uh, eventually placed me on the Appropriations Committee with very excellent uh, uh, committee assignments on the Rules Committee, which is really the place where the final decisions are absolutely made on what comes to the House floor. I do want to talk a little bit about uh, serving on the University Systems Appropriations uh, Subcommittee. And, um, and the only time that I think Speaker Murphy and I had another pretty profound differing opinion was uh, the pressures of the 2002 reapportionment uh, in which uh, I, I really didn't like what the leadership was doing or the Democratic Party was doing and was pretty vocal about it and uh, and uh, it was it's one thing about reapportionment people tend to say what they think and say it uh, say it firmly and he and I had some polite but very uh, firm meetings about, about what would happen in reapportionment in our area. And I think there was some, some division at that time too, but otherwise we had, we had some really nice times and I always appreciated the graciousness he showed to my family and my daughter and, uh, uh, um, and you can't not appreciate the, I, I, I think his service was too long. I think that, that his service probably kept Georgia from having the ability to have Terry Coleman for speaker for a longer time and maybe even prevented Larry Walker from being speaker. And, and the way that uh, the dedication to this strict seniority system uh, and so much loyalty to his friends, which was, uh, you know, part of it, uh, probably, uh, I know one reporter uh, met with, a, with some of my friends and I for lunch, just have lunch one time, and he made the observation that the House of Representatives had been the farm team for statewide candidates in Georgia. But it didn't seem to be like that that, that was continuing to be the, the tradition in Georgia in the, in the 90s. And I think part of it was is that there was a bottle cap. Uh, there was so many people who had served so long and were in positions in the, in the chairman and positions of leadership that continued their service and were doing a good job that that didn't give the next generation of people the natural opportunity to move along. And so I do think 40 years is uh, too long simply because it doesn't give the opportunity for other ideas that may not be better, but they are other ideas. But nevertheless, no one should ever take away from him the fact that he uh, loved Georgia and, and loved his House members even when he was aggravated with them and that he would always keep the door open and always listen to you whether he could... Uh, accommodate you or not, and that uh, he was very pro-working men and women and never forgot that, uh, that um, the, the thing I think is important, which is that, that the people in that chamber are the only folks that the people out there voting have to watch out for them. So do I disagree with the length of service? Yes, but do I think that he provided a remarkable uh, uh, set of accomplishments? Uh, certainly I do. Uh, in that in that uh, in that line of thinking, um, one of the things that uh, that I've noticed commented upon in some that you've mentioned to me earlier, in some of our earlier um, discussions was <clears throat> how we how we went about reform. And I, I mentioned that I was not in the the legislative reform caucus, but <clears throat> after the speaker's race. But one of the, the things that I've reminded myself of was that before the speaker's race, uh, I, I did try to be a good student of, of, of Georgia government in the legislature. And um, one of the things I saw was that we had practices that just were not what you would adopt in an, in if you were creating the system from ground up. I'll say again that perhaps as new members, 
that, that my particular class coming in didn't pay enough attention to the, to the reality of, well, this has been done successfully a long time and, and perhaps it's um, not going to be well received if you, if you say how much you disagree with. But nevertheless, some of the things were so uh, unusual that you, I just felt like I had to comment and I wanted to do it in a professional way, so I wrote up a memo. And in that memo, I talked about the fact, for example, that the Rules Committee at that time in the early 90s, which is the, the last door to get on the House floor, uh, was an open meeting but was held in a room that, um, that was too small to, to hold the crowd. You had to line up through Secretary's office and out in the hall to be able to come in and testify. And a lot of times lobbyists could, and I don't mean any criticism, would get there earlier and could get in the room when members couldn't. Uh, didn't mean anything to have an open meeting if you did, couldn't get in there. We had no computer technology. Uh, we had no word processors in the offices. Uh, we had, um, um, the, the Rules Committee would meet the morning of the session and decide what bills we were going to vote on that morning. And so the members of the House of Representatives might have a thousand bills on the calendar. Maybe, maybe not that many, 500 bills on the calendar. But we didn't know what bills were coming up that morning to be able to study and read and prepare. And <clears throat> most likely the leadership had an idea and no, knew what they were in favor of and what they were uh, going to oppose. But the rank and file members, if, if you had a 20 page bill, you might get two or three minutes notice that that was the bill you were going to have to work on. It, it's not the way you'd want to set up a good government. Uh, again, no computer technology, no, uh, in a time when we had word processing computers, we didn't even, uh, uh, each of us didn't have uh, a computer at that time. Uh, and so many other things like that. For example, we talked about the budgetary process. There was not a clear, there was not a clear pathway of how you presented your budget recommendations. There was not a set schedule of when subcommittees met on a regular basis and so you just had to keep checking to when the, the subcommittees were going to meet if they ever were going to meet. And so I wrote up about a, an eight-page memo that talked about, uh, and I, I tried to make it in a very respectful way. I, I really did and if you read it and I've given you a copy of it, I believe it's worded very respectfully about things that I thought as a student of government I had heard other members in my generation of legislators complain profoundly about. It was the, 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 we call it the slush fund. I didn't call it that in the memo. And that was a fund that was not clearly set forth in the budget. That the method of getting uh, uh, bills into the budget was not clear. That there did not seem to be opportunities for people to advance with special, you know, who had special qualifications or, or backgrounds other than the seniority system. Mention the location of the Rules Committee meeting. Mention setting the calendar for the, uh, for the, uh, the next day was, was not conducive to us making good decisions and knowing if we wanted to amend the bills and if we wanted to make changes. Uh, mention computer technology and the need for all of us to have computer technology and word processing, processing technology. And uh, I'm going to leave a copy of that memo with you and for whatever record keeping you can have. But um, <clears throat> my, I sent that, I, I didn't want to make it an issue. I sent it to the speaker and the leadership of the party and all the chairmen just before the speaker's race took place. And uh, I, I just didn't get any response that those things would be considered at all. Uh, it, was, it was like, well, you know, you just aggravated him, the, the speaker and the leadership by sending that out just before this possible race. And I think the lack of a response to that, um, to that memo had something to do with me wanting to, to think, okay, if you've tried your best to talk about change and the only response is you shouldn't have done that, then, then, then maybe, maybe you've just got to try to make a change. And, well, some uh, of those suggestions have been adopted <laughs> over the years, haven't they? Well, uh, Bob, I looked at it again last night just to, to give myself some review of, of, of the things we might be talking about. And um, I think it's a matter not of any vision in being visionary at that time. It's rather that it was sort of a good summary of really what, was, what needed to be done to make it into a modern legislature. And as I looked through it last night, <clears throat> what surprised me was, I think all of the things in that memo have been done. Fairly rapidly after the, um, after the speaker's race as far as the Rules Committee meeting and the, and the setting of the calendar, 
but, but in subsequent years, the technology that was available during the last few years of Speaker uh, Murphy and Speaker Coleman's administration and now, you know, every Georgian can, and I encourage them to do, as you know, every Georgian has access to watching the actual proceedings of the House of Representatives like I would do during my last service, if the years of service, if the Senate was meeting on the other side and I had a bill in the House and my bill was coming up on the Senate, I could access the Senate's uh, live feed and listen to the debate in the Senate at the, at the same time that the debate was going on in the House. Every Georgian can do that. Every Georgian can check the voting records of their state representatives and state senators and see what the bills say and see the amendments and see the and see the governor's decisions just as if they served in the state legislature themselves. And, and part of making negative politics not working in the future may be for our citizens to realize the technology that's available to them through that program, through services like the, 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 the oral history that, that you're doing here to give people a, a, a history and a vision of where we've come from to see where we want to go. Uh, I think if people would Go on the, and the, again, the legislature is now controlled by a different party than I served with, but they're doing a good job techno technologically. And, uh, and as, as future Georgia uh, uh, elections take place and decisions are made by the people, it's an excellent tool for the people to be informed as, at, during a time that I think we're facing a, a change in Georgia in which we'll go to that purple state that we talked about in which candidates will be elected about the big ideas they've had, like the Hope Scholarship, rather than about what party symbol they have behind their names. Well, Ray, we could go on and on and on. We certainly had enjoyed our conversation, and we invite you back anytime you want to come. Well, it has been a great honor. Uh, one of the things that I told uh, uh, people in getting pre prepared for this um, this interview was how honored I was to be able to share these these thoughts. It is very difficult <clears throat> to summarize um, 14 years of your life. Uh, the, the legislature becomes not only um, what you do, but, uh, but who you are. And it sticks with you. The, the great friends that you've made, the, uh, the, uh, the things that you've learned, uh, I, I do, I do want to, again, in, in, in summary, commenting and the opportunities it's given me um, in, in closing the, um, let me take a look at our time here, um, the, the very best thing, and let's save the best thing for last, during my latter years of service on the Appropriations Committee, I was uh, uh, a member of the University of Georgia, uh, well, it was actually the, the Higher Education Subcommittee that handled the funding for the university system. And so through our committee, we got to see the, um, the role of the Board of Regents, the methodology of the recommendation of the building programs and appropriations. We got to meet such wonderful administrators and, uh, um, and, and, and from time to time staff members uh, uh, in the various departments who would come and share with us uh, great innovations in, uh, in science and technology and the arts and in history and political um, uh, investigations and political science that, that our university system was giving us. Of course, as a, uh, as a two-time University of Georgia graduate, uh, uh, Representative Louise McBee and I always mm -hmm. uh, were the ones there watching out for the University of Georgia, and I felt a special, uh, a special closeness to my alma mater during that time. That um, that I could uh, play a role in in at a time when Georgia's students were going to have the opportunity with the Hope Scholarship Program to have more access to higher education in our state could play a role throughout the system, but but particularly at the University of Georgia, our flagship uh, institution of uh, of giving just the best facilities and the best opportunities and the best. Uh, uh, education and best educators that we could have and so uh, in in retrospect of my 14 years there if uh, if I had only a part of it to continue on it would be uh, the continued uh, support of our, our university and uh, uh, and, I, and I think we all can do that as citizens by uh, by our contributions and to uh, the programs that allow this type of interview to continue to allow these great facilities to be built here to continue to Watch out and support the Hope Scholarship and not let any ambitious politicians in the future take it apart or take credit for it. That's Del Miller's baby. And, uh, and, to, uh, 
And so that, that part of my service is something that I treasure. I think it's because of it sort of you come back to where you started. I started my ambitions uh, in high school and college here at the university and uh, it was an opportunity to give back to this institution that had done so much for me and continues to do so much for my family. And I guess that maybe the real end of that story is the, the nicest thing is that uh, you get to do that in your own life. But you get to, to look at the seeds that maybe you helped a little bit plant uh, uh, a decade or so ago uh, have uh, fruition at a time in your child's life, my daughter Elizabeth's life, and, and all the other students here at the University of Georgia and throughout our education system in Georgia. So I'm proud of that, and I, I truly hope that whoever is both now uh, assigned to hold those responsibilities of trust in our state government on the Board of Regents uh, continue to hold those responsibilities with the same, uh, uh, same treasuring uh, uh, warmth that I held them and that future uh, elected officials and public officials in Georgia will use the same kind of uh, vision that Zell Miller and others used, others and Tom Murphy and the Georgia legislature in, uh, in helping build and continue this fine education system in Georgia. Thank you. Thank you.